All right, so we should be live now, a few minutes late, but I'm here with my friend Carl Benjamin, better known as Sargon of Akkad. Uh, someone I've been talking to on and off, for, well, really since I started my channel. I think my first video was a response to one of your uh, one of your videos. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I always really value these conversations because, I mean, you know, your career... Uh, Mr. Ben, <laughs> Mr. Benjamin, or Sargon, or Carl—it's really Carl's been sort right. of a weather vane of of politics and the internet since you mm. started doing this. And I don't actually know when you started your channel. Well, I first uploaded a video in 2013, and it was a very tepid liberal critique of an Anis Sarkeesian video, uh, <laughs> because none of the community existed that we are. This is pre-Gamergate too, too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. This is pre-Gamergate, yeah which wouldn't come for another year. Um, and so, and I, I, I was not, you know, I, I hadn't really put a great deal of thought into politics mm -hmm. or my own personal philosophy. And so I was just a kind of, I thought of myself as a center left liberal who wanted good things and was generally against bad things. And I have to say the conversations with you have been very useful in my intellectual development because you understand that position very well and you are not hostile to those people in that position and so it's uh, and you are good at articulating the weaknesses with that position which i think i can summarize with the lack of normative instruction for people <laughs> frankly, frankly is the, yeah, the, the problem yeah. with center-left liberalism well i th thanks for the, thank you for those kind words i think that this this is i i would summarize my position you know generally as a general feeling that a lot of the structures of modernity that have emerged in the last 100 to 200 years have critical flaws with them that are mm. becoming rapidly manifest in in sort of horrific ways yeah and and one of them sort of is a lack of normative instruction but this sort of all emerges from i think a crisis in spirituality a crisis in in defining any kind of ethos that defines us from from the yeah. ground up and this is really i mean i think you know again your career is kind of indicative of this uh, uh it started with anita sarkeesian it started with the whole gamer identity being attacked because for many people this consumer product of video games was for for our entire generations young people a sort of talisman of what their aspirations were, how they define themselves relative to the rest of the world. It was all through pop culture. Mm. And then slowly, you know, Gamergate happens and and people kind of, can, I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people underestimated because it was about video games. But the, the, the problem is it wasn't really about video games. It was about the, the spirituality of our generation and it coming to terms with what it actually means to be a community or a person in the modern world. Mm. And, and so the, the problems that, uh, we, you know, people saw in Gamergate had been radiating outwards from, from, I mean, obviously they come from other sources, but, but if you were stuck on the internet, if you're headed in the jar, who's connected to the internet, you'd see these problems radiating out from, from Gamergate and, and being instant in all other places and politics and in you know in politics and all elements of culture mm. and, and now i think this is sort of we, where we are in 2023 it is you know i mentioned this before on the show i feels like we're on a complete political dead zone uh the yeah i mean maybe comment on that i guess right i mean what's what's your impression of the state well, of the west right now when you say dead zone i there there's it feels like there's a calm before the storm mm -hmm. and in in this period of relative peace where not that much is happening actually i think quite a few large m blocks are shifting into new locations where they're going to be difficult to move again uh, the firing of tucker carlson i think is just seismic and a phenomenal mistake but i don't know if you've seen some of the clips going around about him uh, for the, from him recently uh, not the one he released, which did phenomenally well. I love mm -hmm. that it absolutely trounced Fox oh, News's view. Was figures. this the heritage speech, or was no, this his no, reaction to one. being let go? Uh, this was his sort of like basement video, the reaction to being let go. The no, heritage was speech was really good. It was brilliant, right? There, there was another one. Um, 
sorry, I'm just going to check my followers because like uh, who I'm following because I can't remember the name of the account. It's one of the sort of like smaller dissident right accounts that posted a clip of um, the uh, an appearance he'd made on a podcast a few months ago, and it was really brilliant because he was basically. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to give the guy credit for finding it and showing it to everyone because I can't. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't want to leave him without any credit, right? Um, but um, oh god, I can't believe I can't find it. Uh, but it, it was Tucker Carlson saying, I was part of the problem. I was in the mainstream that stigmatized mm -hmm. and pathologized people outside of it. And so I called them conspiracy theorists. I laughed in their face. I didn't take any of the things they were saying seriously. And in obviously in the last like year or so, Tucker has come to realize, oh God, there's something deeply, deeply wrong and terrible about what the milieu he operates in does. Right. He's he, and yeah, he absolutely. in this clip, he literally called them foot soldiers of the regime, you know, like very much the sort of thing you would have said. Right. And so he he is clearly having some kind of intellectual awakening and he's been doing a fantastic job of articulating the problem in what I would call like a, a, a properly conservative way, as in he's speaking in human terms, he's using thick concepts that aren't merely bigotry, right? And so when they're always calling him names, none of them mm. have stuck because actually that's not what he's doing. And I don't think he actually is a bigot. I don't think he is a white nationalist. I don't think he's no. any of these things. I think he's someone who has a more aesthetic view of what it is to be a human, right? The human being is as much a sort of artistic project as it is anything else. And so to take care of the feelings that we have for one another and for our own country is the basic position that Tucker Carlson is coming from, which is totally radical. It's, it's not rationalist at all. It's totally outside of the social contract framework. You know, he's speaking like an old world conservative, right, in modern yeah. American politics, which is very unusual. You know, it's very unusual. And that's what made him such a rare and very clear voice. Because he everyone everyone talks about him like he's some sort of boomer whisperer, and he kind of is. You know, he absolutely is. But he yeah. He's not his, his role on Fox News was critical. I mean, that uh, was yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And and it is true that him being deplatformed from Fox News is a, an L for the right. It's absolutely true. But mm -hmm. the 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 real talent that he had was talking like a normal human being, right? And that was like he he doesn't use eclectic philosoph philosophical jargon. He doesn't try and say, he doesn't have to put on airs and pretensions and actually you can mm -hmm. tell in some ways he kind of dumbs himself down and speaks in he he, he properly articulates the points that are genuine that are genuinely held in the hearts of the patriotic boomers who themselves don't have the education to articulate and so they come out in in slogans you know and tucker carlson was brilliant at morally validating everything that they were saying and He's right, right? Fundamentally, he's right about all of the things he's saying. And he's come to the conclusion that whatever, you know, the, the dual, the, the monoparty regime that is ruling over the United States is, and whatever you want to characterize it as, that's the problem. And that's destroying America, America's position in the world. And as a consequence, Europe and anyone else dependent, the entire Anglosphere. And I think that's why they got rid of him. I think it's because he's actually arrived at quite a radical position, which is the Republicans and Democrats need to be destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. The the political the political class Delinda est. I mean, Tucker Carlson is sort of the absolute picture of a rogue elite. And he comes yeah. from La Jolla, California, which I'm sure you don't know of this place. It's a suburb of San Diego. But if you were to take sort of the waspy red elites of the old yesteryear yeah. and then the insufferable liberal progressive elites of current year in California, and you were to intersect those circles, the Venn diagram would be these sort of La Jolla class yeah. rulers that, that live in that area of California. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's the picture of an elite in so many ways with he, he's he's literally an heir he has yeah. connections to intelligence agencies he's on mainstream news you know uh all, all of these things but what can, was can really I make so a quick point here yeah. actually sorry sorry just to interrupt but this yeah. this is something that's a obvious to me as a brit right um we're, we're very class conscious and mm -hmm. it's very obvious that tucker carlson comes from the upper class and there was um who was that 
uh, the, the, the gay guy from Vox or BuzzFeed that got hold of an old radio interview that Tucker had done, where oh, Tucker is saying, know. well, yeah, I'm from the aristocracy. I'm not one of the working men, <laughs> you know, obviously. <laughs> and he was playing this as if it was a gotcha. Yeah. And, and everyone was like, we know, you know, we that's the opening know. of half his monologues, right? <laughs> exactly, right? It's I mean, he's so... an Episcopalian, right? Like, I mean, that's what yeah. American people call Church of England, right? I mean, you yes. can't get more elite than that in this country. But, but also, the um, oh, I can't remember his name. It really annoys me. I should be able to remember his name. But this, but this guy also misses the point, right? Yeah, because Tucker Carlson is courting the the kind of constituency that has this kind of sentimental view of their own country and the people in it and it's very similar in england actually this view where it we don't hate the elites at all actually in fact in many ways a lot of the elites people like tucker carlson and a good uh, proxy in england would be someone like jacob rees mogg right mm. uh, the working class do not hate the aristocracy they just want the aristocracy to be on their side to work in their interests yeah. to protect them you know, to, honestly, kind of like a Pokemon, basically, you know, like you go and fight our battles and we'll be, you know, we'll pay our taxes. You'll maintain your position. We'll we're, we're guaranteed the, the, the small amount that we have and we'll feel like the country is being run as it should be run. I mean, they Tucker, want a proper nobility, right? They want a exactly. proper nobility. Exactly. I mean, a, a and genuinely, that's, that's their right to have, in my opinion. I agree. I completely agree. And so and Tucker fulfills this role perfectly for the Americans. He is. And, and the response to Tucker being fired, I saw probably about three or four people on the dissident right who were complaining mm. about Tucker Carlson, and they were shut down very, very swiftly by this overwhelming tide of goodwill that was just coming from everywhere. You know, Tucker has achieved the correct tone. He's achieved the correct manner. He seems like he's a fair dealer. He's not vindictive. He, I, I, I literally can't think about, of an aspect of Tucker's personality I would really fault him for. And it seems that he's thought about these things very hard and realized the kind of man he's supposed to be. You know, there's an obligation, a, no, a noblesse oblige on him that he is leaning into and trying to fulfill. And so the, the, the warmth of the reaction like I watched academic agent stream talking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he ends up in the stream going, telling everyone, look, yes, I love you all. You know, I have to say it because I've kind of talked myself into this, but yes, of course I love you. All. We all love each other. That's why we're doing any of this. We love our countries. We love each other. We know why we're doing this. And it was so funny to watch, you know, the, the, the Daria of the internet yeah. being forced. Like, yes, of course I love you. all. shut up, you know, stop making <laughs> me say it. But that, but that was the, that was the genuinely warm emotional response of everyone rallying around Tucker. It's like, no, 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 he's our guy. You know, he's our aristocrat. You know, he's been looking out for us. He's been literally in the belly of the beast, speaking for us in our language for years now. And we know why they got rid of him. And we're not going to give him up. We're not going to abandon him. Yeah, actually, I want to comment on the tone a little bit because I, I do, about halfway through Tucker Carlson's, career if we measured it based on mm. you know when he when we got based and when he was fired i kind of realized the tone i recognized the tone that came out of his mouth very distinctly and you're right he's dumbing it down mm. and it's it's sort of this way of talking that i recognize very much from my own father and i think a lot of dads have cultivated this particular way of talking yeah. uh but but it's very it's very it's a very particular talk so and I know neither of us, well, I don't think that we have old enough children that we're actually ready to have this talk again. But, but as my friend Aaron McIntyre has put it, and I know I've put this concept before many times myself, although Aaron has a way of summarizing it much better than I ever could. Hmm. There's all of these sort of little lies that we tell our children when they're growing up to kind of cover the tracks of a more complicated and darker truth. And then somewhere along their journey into adolescence, we need to kind of come clean over the fact that the, 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 the story we gave them when they were children was sort of a cover for this deeper truth. And so the tone of this conversation has to be kind of very frank, but also sort of dumbed down. But it's also sort of a process of going, okay, this thing that we thought we had as a country that's an illusion. That was a story we told ourselves that's false. Hmm. But the core thing that was here, the core element of America 
that we fought for, that's still worthwhile, right? So yeah. the story I told you about Santa Claus is not true, but the story about how we sincerely celebrate Christmas is true. And yeah. you know, you need to understand that uh, because we're tearing down this illusion around you, we are not necessarily trying to tear down the the um the 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 actual essence of the thing. And I, I said this in my last essay, and I'm glad you mentioned love. Uh, the the reaction that we need to have towards these illusions being torn down around us that sort of separate us from the past it, is to and I used an auto antonym here. It's to it's to cleave ever closer to the spirit of what our ancestors loved, even mm -hmm. if the harshness of the reality of the present age cleaves us away from the forms they pursued. So, so if American democracy is in many ways a, a lie, and I don't know if I should necessarily use those words because I don't think that's what Tucker believes, but elements of it certainly are are lies. And, you know, we still need to find a way to love what was at the core of the American vision, e even if the form of what's around it in the government is just not believable or, or worthy of our time. And I, I would summarize Tucker's career that way, right? Just a, sorry to tangent. So I, I found no, no, no. the guy's, the, the, the account is a guy called Remnant Posting. Um, oh, no, I know him. He's a friend. Yeah, yeah, he's really, really good account, by the way. Posts really good <laughs> stuff, and he's the guy who found it. I, like I said, I, I was sorry if I looked distracted there, but I was scrolling like, come on, no, no, I must no, it's be fine. able to find this guy. You know, I was listening, obviously. Um, yeah, I, so one one thing that I find interesting is, as you say, the trajectory of Tucker Carlson's critics. I first was introduced to Tucker because obviously I'm foreign, so I don't get Fox News or anything. But I was introduced to him uh, quite early on in the internet when he had his debate with John Stewart and some other guy who represented the mm. Democrat, and he was like, oh, oh yes, America, right? the, the crossfire one. That's and Tucker it, yeah. was on CNN, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Tucker wasn't bad then, right? He wasn't, he wasn't like a problem or anything, but he was kind of representative of a kind of milk toast Republican, right? Yeah. Who, who hadn't thought very hard about anything. And obviously he's a lot younger at that point. And like you say, like there's been a definite change and he's really become someone that I think a lot of people have a genuine affection for. I mean, I'm one of them. I, I, oh, yeah. I literally am going to miss Tucker's monologues on Fox News because whenever I'm like doing the dishes or something, I'll put one on and just listen to what he has to say. And it's always very level-headed, very reasonable. And when dumbing down is possibly the wrong word to use because he's not dumbing down the substance of what he's saying. He's just saying it in very plain English, right? Yeah. And that's fine. You make it accessible. There's, you don't need to be pretentious. There's no need for it. And if anything, it just shows a lack of ego on his own part, right? That he's prepared to do that. Because I'm sure, as you say, you know, with his level of education, his background, he could have made it much more impenetrable. But he wants to talk to the average American because he feels a moral obligation to the average American. He likes his own country. And he likes his countrymen. So it, I, I don't want to dwell too much on Tucker because it's like, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not the only thing to talk about. But there, there is something about this that has definitely been a mistake for Fox News. Like, I don't think they understood. The moral well, yeah, but this is business-wise, it's certainly a mistake. I mean, they lost huge amounts of money on this, but but yeah. this is, I guess this is where I kind of, I'm kind of going with the whole politics is dead mm. kind of thing, is that our, our elites have kind of stopped pretending that this whole thing, like the, mm. the free market or the free market of ideas is real. They understand what the stakes yeah. are and the stakes are power. And power will always, I mean, if you have, if someone gives you a choice between grabbing the power and grabbing the money, always grab the power. And and deep down in their lizard hearts, they know this. They know that. And because yeah. and, once you have the power, you can take the money. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and, and then whatever comes from that, in the words of Al Pacino and Scarface, and you can do the equation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, well, actually, I think but, he reversed it. But <laughs> but, ju but just, just a quick thing on Tucker there. That, yeah. Like, Tucker, I don't think they'd realized it, but I think Tucker has adopted, ascended to a kind of totemic position in patriotic political circles, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, he had been such a decent chap, right? I mean, he's one of the few elites that I think, oh, he's probably not a part of a pedo ring, right? Yeah. Like he's, he's one of the few that I actually think would raise a moral objection to that. 
and would not go to sorts of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so like I genuinely think that the reaction to him being fired shows that actually Tucker has accrued to himself such goodwill that he has become a kind of lodestone on the right. And I don't think they understood quite what they had in him. And as you say, the, the numbers just across the board were just straight down. And so it's interesting that he was the rising tide that was lifting all boats for them. Now, I don't know whether yeah. that's going to hold or not. You know, we don't know what Tucker's going to do next. We don't know whether they'll recover, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think a mistake has been made there, actually. You know, I think that he's got enough positive attachment to him from enough people who are probably also quite powerful uh, that something may come of this. Don't hold me. Don't hold me to it. I might be completely wrong. But it looks like a massive mistake to me. I mean, I, I, this was obviously Mur Murdoch's decision because Murdoch was more, he was always more aligned with the neocons. Who and else Tucker's skepticism. Tucker. Yeah, it's skepticism over things like the, I don't, I don't know this is the fact, but I suspect that it's things like skepticism over the Ukraine war yeah. or attacks on business interests that come from that general group of people that led to this schism and, and sort of a fear about that. But I think you're right in a sense he's closing the barn door after the horse has already sped away the they the republican party i mean they're trying to get it to go back to paul paul ryan and mitt romney but there, there will never be popular enthusiasm in that direction again i guess they could just elect these people but no one's going to believe in it mm -hmm. but i i'm mean, to kind of bring it back to your country uh european politics have demonstrated to me that genuine belief in political parties is totally unnecessary <laughs> that's completely true yeah that's completely does, true does anyone believe in the tories uh you know rishi sunak uh, he seems like a man without a constituency i've never met a, i mean how many brits do i know but i i know but I he, know he if... literally is a man without a constituency he, yeah. he 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 is in richmond north which is in north yorkshire uh rishi mm -hmm. sunak comes from southampton Actually, he was born and raised in Southampton, but of course, he's the the son of Indian immigrants, and he's married to the daughter of an Indian billionaire. So, mm. in no way does he represent North Yorkshire. You know, he doesn't. But they vote conservative consistently, and so he was parachuted in, and so that's and he and you can tell when the way he talks, he's totally plastic, yeah. totally false, inauthentic, and he talks to you like he's a children's presenter. Like he's you can see the reflection of the teleprompter in the back of his eyes at all moments. Yeah. And and so yeah, you're exactly right. He's a man without a constituency. And, and nobody wanted him anyway. I mean, Liz Truss is thick as two short planks and almost completely unlikable, devoid of charisma. And she trounced him at two to one in the Conservative yeah. Party internal vote. So you can see that this is essentially a fix. Yeah, but, but the, the, I guess the, here comes the question, I mean, to what extent does politics matter anymore? The entire political side of YouTube in the last eight months has just been – I mean, I think, you know, obviously mm -hmm. your, your channel, The Lotus Eaters, is doing very well because of high production qualities and topical content and all that stuff. And, and we've been doing all right in our own little spheres. But general enthusiasm for political issues mm. has just evaporated. And I talk to people, sort of general people off the street, and and the cynicism when it comes to anything changing in, in a way that's not just more of the same mm. sort of Biden Biden regime kind of direction where, where it's some kind of woke technocratic bureaucracy that 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 closed itself in, in the language of civil rights. Everyone I should say everyone knows where that's going and no one thinks that that can really change, at least from the position of where I live. Well, the, this is um, something that polls in Britain and America have shown. So Generation Z just have very little faith in democracy. And you can't mm. really blame them, can you? You know, People keep voting for things, keep not getting those things. Problems keep not getting solved. Mm. It's very clear that the will of the electorate just is not being expressed at this point. And the people in charge just don't seem to care. The institutions that aren't you know, not necessarily intrinsically democratic, but are usually considered to be part of the democratic process, such as a free press, are not playing their part. And if they do try to play their part, they get censored. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised that people are feeling very disillusioned because it looks like there's some kind of insurgent force that's taken over our countries 
that we can't dislodge by voting them out. Yeah, but uh, the the thing is, this insertion force is the exigent ruling class of the West for the last like fifty well, years, no, no, I on, think. Hang, right? Hang on. That, so when I when I say this insurgent force it mm. controls the ruling class um but i don't think it is the ruling class uh that's not what i'm that's not what i mean necessarily mm. um for example the the example i always use is the bbc and gb news right gb news is the bbc from about 15 years ago uh it's also made up of a lot of people who are in either sky news or the bbc uh, mm. who have been pushed out of Sky News and the BBC, but pushed out by what? You know, and the the answer is this technocratic managerial ideology, right? That, yeah. that is capturing people. And I I got into it with the Tory boys on Twitter today because I was like, look, King Charles is going to be a woke monarch, and they were like, oh, you hate the monarchy? It's like, no, I hate wokeism. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very obvious that King Charles is going is captured by woke ideology, and. Again, that's the force, you know, whatever we want to, however we want to describe it. But the sum total of that thing, that that force, you can see it pushing through institutions and capturing castles, as it were. And uh, I, th I think it's very disillusioning. Well, the, I mean, this is sort of the the problem with a lot of this stuff. This is something that we describe in in sort of right wing or political realist theory all the time mm -hmm. about how the the the, the power process naturally exiles its opponents. They push out people they mm. no longer need. And so when you look at conservative movements or counter regime forces, a, a lot of what you have are, are the people that are there and, and probably the Tory boys count as this. They're, they're there because they can't be part of the ruling class proper. And, and especially yeah. with all this woke stuff, I mean, we're, you're, you're getting this stuff secondhand from America, basically. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it 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 comes from places like Berkeley, California, and and the Ivy League schools in this country, and and the the opposition because of how it's constructed, it's constructed basically from the, the rejects of of this elite system, mm -hmm. and right now, you know, the the ruling class is feeling a little bit paranoid, and I I don't know exactly what this means though because they seem to believe that there is no real opposition that can take over for them and it's hard to see really what's on the horizon in this capacity I uh, I don't see something immediately coming up uh, you know despite the work that we're doing I said I should say right so in in Britain um, uh, speaking specifically to the case of Britain uh, I think it's an interesting development that woke ideology is metastasizing into a form that suits this country. Uh, initially, it was very much an American import just two years ago. Uh, but now, the expulsion of, say, Diane Abbott from the Labour Party has shown that actually, in the British version of woke ideology, you can be racist to white people. A black woman <laughs> can be racist to white people because, and I've, I said this to the Americans a lot, it is not worth saying the word white over here because we have layers of society that are white but are obviously being oppressed mm -hmm. from the left-wing perspective. Uh, and people who will historically claim this are, of course, uh, the Irish and the Gypsies and, of course, the Jews. Uh, so these people are very light-skinned but will not, and will not be accepted into some kind of hegemonic class of white people because they're not, and they never have been, or at least... Uh, Jews aside, obviously, um, in in Britain in particular, but of course with Jews with Germany in the 1940s, it's a, a, a separate issue there. Um, but the the Irish and the Gypsies were systematically oppressed as a matter of policy, and yeah. they were very white. And so Diane Abbott was fired, uh, was ejected from the Labour Party for saying that these people couldn't experience racism. But by all metrics, what what the British did to the Irish was definitely racism. You know, it's absolutely racism. Um, and this manifested in her being a, a black woman being expelled from this party. And so that's very interesting development in left-wing ideology in Britain. But as you were saying um, about the sort of um, the, the elites being pushed out and not having a way of fighting back, well, it is, it is actually interesting how there are there, there is a change in the water here, right? There is something very strange going on, and I'm actually really kind of excited about it 
because we've mm. arrived at the point where, for example, Good Morning Britain, this is one of the largest, probably the largest breakfast program in the United Kingdom. Uh, there was a, an Indian lady called Narinda Kaur or Kaur, uh, who was screeching about how Britain was an evil colonial racist imperial empire. And England had, England specifically had nothing to be proud of. And on the other side, they had a chap called Tom Skinner, mm-hmm. who a lot of people were describing as, quote, a chud. Uh, but a, a very well-mannered, well-minded English man. And he's from the lower classes. And he was just sat opposite her, smiling and waving his England flag. Mm-hmm. And the host was a man called Ed Balls, who was previously a Labour MP. And he refused to budge from his, no, I think there are redeemable qualities about England. And the one he landed on was the classic boomer, we defeated fascism in World War yeah, II. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> He wasn't taking it, and you can see he he sat there with his little smirk, saying, "No, no, I think we, I think we have redeeming quality. That's it, and uh, I'm not going to budge from this." And then on the other side, you've got so you know he's like part of the political establishment. On the other side, you've got uh, a working class Englishman just grinning stupidly, waving an England flag on live telly on to mil- you know millions of people in the middle of the day. That was massive, like five mm-hmm. years ago. That sort of thing didn't happen, and. You know, if it did happen, it was Piers Morgan getting BTFO off his own show, Good Morning Britain. The reason that Piers Morgan is no longer on Good Morning Britain is because he was essentially shamed out by his woke weatherman, right? Who using yeah. racial politics. And she was trying to do the same and it failed. And it was like, right. And there was no backlash, right? There was a lot of woke screaming, but actually, a lot of people found themselves like locked out of the moral argument there. Uh, and so that was an interesting thing. And also, we've had a surprising number of people who would we, we would call elites actually starting to coalesce in Britain. So we've got Andrew Bridgen, who is a massive vaccine, vaccine skeptic, uh, mm-hmm. who was on our podcast recently. We've got like quite a few um, musicians, like famous musicians, like Right Said Fred, Morrissey, and a bunch of others. Uh, and then we, we had Matt Letizia on the other day. Now, if you don't follow football, soccer, mm-hmm. uh, I don't. I had no idea who he is. Um, my dad is a massive Southampton fan and has been his whole life. This guy's a living legend in Southampton. And he was on the podcast just essentially exactly on our position on all of these things. Yeah. And so actually there is quite a large uh, and growing uh, sort of dissident elite uh, in that in, in, in a, a sort of budding uh, re- resistance that has arrived at the position of we're not apologizing and we actually don't care, right? We're just going to smile and wave our England flags, um, and that that is kind of encouraging, actually. So it's it's an interesting development. But it's kind of encouraging. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I regard this as encouraging and also a little bit worrying because it's very clear from America, at least, that the 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 adults in the Democratic Party want to put the woke away. Mm-hmm. And this is not a means of fixing the woke. This is to keep their ruling apparatus chugging along. And so they're ex- they're making cultural concessions in some areas, purely symbolic ones, mind you, that they they just never were before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I do respect you know, it very much in in the whole white thing when people say white this is a term of use that really only has use in european colonies like south africa and america and stuff like that what people mean when they say white is they mean the european stock of whatever country you're currently belonging to in a country with a long and storied history like the united kingdom that obviously has very little relevance considering there are battle lines drawn very recently around things that are much more relevant um the 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 problem i i see though is that we're we're kind of leaving the 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 big issue in all of this is that sure you know there are sane people who don't want to just watch the world burn Mm -hmm. and they 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 are going to kind of pull us back from the brink or and maybe they can in the united kingdom i doesn't look like they can in america certainly i don't know if there's enough of them to do that and and i hope that they do in Europe, in many cases, it's it's sort of less far gone in that regard. There's still sort of a constituency there that might be able to kind of get themselves together, especially if the power and influence in America starts waning a little bit, or or, mm. we, or we look crazy, and you know you can, you can detach from the the millstone that is the culture of America, kind of dragging you down, or mm. not the culture of America, the 
you know, the the ruling class culture of America. That's in of, many ways, it is actually the culture as well, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of iterations, right? There's yeah. going to be a lot of people who, who there, there was an old school American culture that quite clearly this ruling class does not embody yeah. and that most people are, are, are very loyal to. But but the, the critical problem about uh, th that I sort of foresee in modernity, and this is going to reassert itself regardless of whether you can kick out the crazies this time around, the question that will continuously reassert itself is who are we and what do we believe in and why is it important for us to carry forward? Why is it important for us to, to have families to, mm. to continue on our lines, to see our grandchildren? Why is it important for us to, to stay in reality and to overcome and to undergo pain when there is this virtual reality space where artificial intelligence can generate anything we want anytime? Why do we want to live? The story of, you know, this is something that Spengler talks about. There are a lot of French existentialists that talks, talk about this a lot in the 1920s. Uh, it's always a bad sign when you have a hard time answering the question, why shouldn't I kill myself? And huge swaths of the West right now are having a hard time answering the question. Not, not, not necessarily like literally kill yourself, but kill, kill no, yourself in sort mean. of a collective sense, right? Yeah. Which, yeah. you know, for instance, not having kids would be, you know, functionally killing yourself in this regard. Why but does once, your civilization justify itself? Yeah, wh why does your collectivity justify itself? Now, yeah. Spengler has... Oswald Spengler, the author of yeah. um, the, uh, the, the fall of the Western fall of Western civilization, he um, he said that as soon as, as soon as you ask this question, you're just doomed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but in in our eternal Faustian optimism, Carl, I I do think that that this 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 question of why not kill yourself, what is uh, what is the motivating desire to believe and live is something that can on an individual level be rediscovered. And maybe that's, that, that is less the saving of this civilization in the beginning of something new, which is sort of where my thinking is going right now. Uh, but, but, but that's, that, that question can't be answered by, you know, Gen Xers decide that they don't want to just destroy the nation that they grew up in. Right. I think it can be answered on a collective level as well. Um, mm. the, so just to, let me let me address one thing that you said. The academic agents have been saying a lot and hasn't necessarily been right on. Uh, they want to put woke back in the box, right? So yeah, yeah. this, this I, I will take this up with him at some point, but this ascribes to the dominant figures of the left a level of control and self-awareness that I don't think they possess, frankly. I don't think they understand that they are being driven by forces beyond their control, right? And so when they say, when he says they want to put work back in the box, what he's saying is they don't want to lose elections, right? They don't want to lose cultural ground. They don't want to lose castles. Um, but the problem that yeah. they have is that the forces of woke are conquering them on terms with which they agree, right? And they know this. And yeah. so they like they failed the other day um, with uh, what was it? I can't remember what it was, but academic agent had to tweet about it going, yeah, okay, this didn't get put away. You know, it was a it was some woke victory that they'd had over something. Um, and it, you you this this reveals that yes, they know that there's something about this kind of cultural change that is going to lead to defeats in the future, and. They want to avoid the defeat, but that is not the same as them saying we want to put work away. It, it, Keir Starmer is obviously taking tips from Blair, which is very yeah. self-evident. And Blair, being the arch-political pragmatist, has always been of the opinion, just censor your radicals, just get rid of them, just eject them. And that's what really is at the heart of kicking out Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party. Well, that's uh, that's the thing, right? Like, the, the Diane Abbott thing, like, that's, yeah. for me, that's concerning because... As somebody who who you know, again, I'm I'm a little bit older than most people who do YouTube, right? I think I'm closer to your age than than yeah. most of the people who watch me, 
you know, which, you know, we're pretty close in age, I think. But I, uh, I, I remember this, like in California was, Northern California was just the perfect place to watch this evolve hmm. because California used to be a Republican state and there were a lot of areas of it that were very Republican back in the 90s. Yeah. And, and I know how this works. This, this hmm. whole idea that there are white victim groups that like you as a white person could use the civil rights logic to cash checks Mm -hmm. This was sort of the consolation prize that California and Republicans took sort of with them that, you know, right. somehow the left will be like the left is really cares about racism. So so the way we can do the left yeah. in is we can hold the left accountable for its racism by saying yeah. like yeah. affirmative action and racial preferences. They're the real racists. Are, they're the real yeah. racists. Yeah. This this works and it worked. It actually kind of worked in the 80s, but it it doesn't like the. the the I'm not check advocating. They give you is a bad that, one. Eventually, it runs out. Right. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm, I'm not advocating for that, and I'm not saying that um, they won't accept that in order to maintain the framework. They absolutely will, and in this way, AA is right that it's not so much putting the woke away. What they're doing is reigning in the extremes in order to keep us on the same track, right, on the mm -hmm. same rails. So we will slowly progress to their destination rather than at warp speed. Yes. And in, in saying that he is correct, right? And already we can see the Tory boys essentially internalizing left wing mm -hmm. framing and rhetoric and saying, well, this is just the way things are now. And that's okay. We'll move on from this point. It's like, no, um, but that's not what I'm, what, when I, when I say this sort of dissident elite sort mm -hmm. of uh, gathering, these are people who are totally outside of that frame, actually, and who aren't content to go along with these things. It's not to say that they're against uh, anti-racism per se, uh, but just don't tend to think in those terms. They're not thinking of racism when they're thinking of what they're doing, right? So they're not thinking in that frame. Again, not that I'm saying they have a fully coherent thought out plan or anything like this, but it's, it's people who would relates to what Tucker Carlson says, right? Because Tucker mm -hmm. Carlson very rarely goes, oh, the left of the real racist, right? He, he doesn't focus on that as a subject. And so there is that existing. But uh, but I, the, the point I just wanted to make there is just there is something happening here that isn't just, oh, the left of the real racist. I mean, that's happening in the left where you have, you know, a roiling class of victim groups. Um, and the conservatives do engage in that, which is sufferable to be honest. But there is something outside of that that's happening. Um, but it, that's all I wanted to say on that. But I mean, in, a, in every other respect, I do agree. You know, this is to keep it on the track. But there is something yeah. else happening. Uh, what I'm always, I, I always look for is, is what do young people really believe in? Mm. And this, this is something that uh, I, I think I, we obviously in America, we're we're going to get a lot more wokeism. The the leadership class is trying to put it back in its box, but they're yeah. not going to succeed. And the reason why they're not going to succeed is because we've raised an entire generation of young, well, of well, of young people, the ones that weren't essentially taken out of the system to hold these identity groups as a primary identity. So and there's a poll that came out today uh, that in the new generation in America, at least, like 25% of the children identify as LGBTQ or yeah. something plus. It's something like that here too. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it doesn't actually represent a behavior. It represents a, a, a sort of adherence to the system, a, a sort of- An incentive I'm structure. Accepting. Yeah. Well, it's uh, my my meaning is derived for being part of this story of civil rights and oppressed classes, and my membership in this alphabet soup is my ability to kind of share in in these beliefs, to share in this new identity, and to be part of the future. Uh, the the problem is, and and you know I think this is something that you see more in culture is just that there th this is just this radically not believable. And it's radically ugly when you kind of take it out into the world and and kind of see how these identities play out. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Of course, we we saw in America we had this whole. I don't know if everyone calls it this. The right wingers call it like the transurrection kind of deal. Uh, it, basically, it's a number of 
the Democrats have kind of pulled off the trick where they move from it's not happening at, to it's good that it is. And they've gone yeah. full on board with the we need to make what they call uh, we, we need to make trans affirming care available to children in all 50 mm. states. And so what's happened is sort of like, especially and it was weird because this happened in the wake of this very prominent uh, school shooter who was, I'm not going to say we know that they were motivated by trans issues, but it seems we, we haven't got their manifesto before. yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking so, forward to it. This is this is launched kind of like these bizarre like internal like these basically like these internal color rel revolutions in red yeah. states, where where sort of these the these blue affiliated uh, dissident groups show up in state capitals, and, and sort of wield an outsized amount of force to hmm. push back against uh, a political issue that if you poll the American people it would be, you know, it, it would it would it would pull probably in the single digits I, I would imagine yeah. like this or if it was sort of put in plain English and not behind hmm. euphemisms. And uh, this is sort of like, I don't know how depressing this is, but this is this is what the establishment uh, believes it can do. And it can do this because there there is no rival belief system that can that can that can really give young people um, a motivation for existence and a belief in a future that's that's actually authentic. And, and that's more or less why I see it are, are, are are struggling with at this point. Well, th this is why. Tom Skinner waving the English flag with a big silly grin on his face and winning the argument <laughs> on live TV on a mainstream channel in the middle of the day felt quite seismic to me um, because actually he was literally saying, I'm English, I love England, and I'm not apologizing for it. And I'm actually happy mm -hmm. about this. And he was the one who won the argument right against the progressive activist of color uh, with other English people on his side. And this actually is something that you can sell to young people that they can believe in, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's actually a lot of depth to the English identity that's been denied from children. And this is one thing that I'm working on instilling into my own children, actually. Um, and I have a lot of young people coming to me who are in their early 20s and asking me about England and the mm -hmm. concept and the, the ideal and the history and it's very heartening that there are actually people going to hound and in fact we we have a, a zoom call every month with our gold tier members and mm. one of the one of the young lads on that he was literally looked about 20 he was like should we use the language of the left or should we just stand on our own language and i was like no really we should just stand on our own language actually. yeah always um yeah, but I mean, you know, don't be wrong. If you're in a thick conversation with a bunch of lefties, then fine. Say, look, we, we just want to articulate the concerns of the English community if you have to, right? Um, <laughs> which which is fine, actually. You know, there's a kind of entryway into the conversation to to bring it onto your turf if you want, yeah. to make sure that they understand there's, there's a political entity here that wants to talk. Um, but when he, like, for example... Uh, one of the conversations that's happening a lot in British political circles at the moment is with immigrants who are claiming to be British, and that's fine, they can claim to be British, mm -hmm. but a lot of them have been claiming to be English. I've seen amazing amounts of pushback on this, because mm. as this young man today asked me, well, you know, what what should our stance be on that? And I was just flat out like, being English is something you inherit from your parents. If one or yeah. more of your parents and one or both of your parents are English, then you're English, ethnically. If not, then you are not ethnically English. Now, there's a way to join the English tribe, which is adopt the culture, adopt the mannerisms, say the shibboleths, uh, join the festivals, become one of us. And we'll and this happens everywhere. You know, it's always very flattering when a foreigner comes into the tribe. And wants to adopt and incorporate into the tribe. It's a very flattering thing. And it's almost always universally loved. You know, when you go to a foreign country and you start speaking in their language from a guidebook, you always see a smile on the face. You know, there's always, it's always nice from their point of view, right? Uh, yeah. And so that's, there's a kind of way of like joining the tribe, which I think is something we should extend to the foreigners living here, just as a kindness, really, if nothing else, right? I, I don't think we just want to say, no, look, you're not ethnically English, therefore go away. You know, that's a horrible thing to do. And I don't think I wins any friends. I don't think yeah. it persuades anyone. Um, and so, you know, bringing them in and saying, no, you, you can do things that English people do. That's fine. Right. Um, but 
the woke progressive immigrant activists have been arguing that they are English and they can be advocates of foreign interests. And for example, this Narinda Kaur woman mm -hmm. constantly advocates about Indian interests. Uh, she's a third generation immigrant. She's her, her parents have been here their whole lives and she's been here her whole life. She's in her forties now and still she goes on about India. So it's like, look, Mm -hmm. It's very clear. And she speaks about herself as on the outside to the English. So people are not letting her have this. And I'm, I'm seeing this like in normie Facebook groups that don't talk about politics. Usually I'm seeing just random people who are just completely normal. And otherwise, you know, if you look at their profile, they've just got football results and stuff like that. And you yeah. know, pop stars and stuff, but they'll, they'll be saying this sort of stuff. And I'm like, right. Okay, there is something happening. Like, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of awakening where it's like, look, you know, you can come and hang out at our barbecues, but we are English and we're not giving it up. And so that's something unusual and heartening. And again, like five years ago, three years ago, I can't imagine that a guy, an English, an English working class lad could be waving an England flag on TV and just smiling and saying, don't care, I'm English, and win the argument. That was inconceivable. You know? Yeah, but, that. but so the, the thing is, is that like the... I think the direction you paint is very optimistic, but the, the, the hurdles we see in front of us here, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to this, is what does it mean to be English? Now, there's good answers for that. For instance, yeah. in America, we don't have this. Uh, America, all throughout the 19th century, did not have a common identity as a country. It had regional identities. And you can still see this in the South, for instance, the Dixie mm -hmm. South, not the mm -hmm. Southwest. <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, around the 1930s, the, the federal government, probably a little bit earlier than this, probably around Woodrow Wilson, spent great efforts trying to move these regional identities into a unified American yeah. white identity. And then this, this transmogrified over the process of the 60s into America essentially being an economic sim. Yeah. And the the thing is, is that this woman who thinks that she is Indian and believes in India, I mean, you know, I think she's being sort of incredibly rude to her host country. Like she's doing something that if I were uh, a an American, a German American, or just, you know, someone of my ethnicity living in China, I would feel it very rude to kind of pose as a Chinese person and then talk endlessly about, about European or American politics. That would be very, very yeah. rude. Uh, but but it's not just in her imagination that that she feels Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is this is a culture and and a set of belief systems that you know is very storied. And so she, when when she calls herself an Indian, uh, she's drawing on that and uh, like that in her heart of hearts it reflects that and and it has feeling and passion. And mm -hmm. before you go on, like this is something that the turning point. I saw this. You know, I always see sort of reactions on my little breaks from work uh, yeah. when I go into Twitter and I never have time to reply to them. But there is an organization, Turning Point UK, I guess you've got yeah. one there, where it says something like, yeah. uh, it's something like, no matter where you come from, you can be British. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, and the, the obviously follow up thing is the sort of the Matt Walsh question, like, what does it mean to be British? Like, without mentioning a cuisine. Right. Don't mention fish and chips or tea and tell me what it means to be British. You know, yeah. don't mention apple pie and tell me what it means to be American. And nobody can do that. And, and nobody is going to believe in something that has such a light amount of substance to it. Uh, a true ethnic, you know, so hang on, hang on. Let me... from something deeper, you know? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I've dominated. No, no, there, there, there is, there is more to it. Right. But people like Narinda Kaur have, insert it have, have assumed that being british means being a woke american right it's it's woke mm. american contract theory that she's trying to substitute being british for um but there is there is actually something more to it than that um there it is essentially about a series of traditional standards that are set in a way that create a specific kind of order like uh think um it really, it's the sort of imperial British mindset, right? And it's actually quite distinct and recognizable. Um, it's very hierarchical, very class-based, and pathologically obsessed with duty. And mm. this does have, because of the empire, a broad and incorporative aspect to it. So if you do your duty, 
to king and country, then yes, you you can be fully adopted into the British identity. That is correct, right? And so we do have something like the American identity, but it's not the same, and it doesn't operate in the same way. It's not rationalistic like the American social contract is, right? It's not you have to believe a proposition. It's that you have to perform fealty and service in favor of the crown and Britain. And this is why Narinda's grandparents came here in the first place, right? Because they had done this. And so the grandparents would have recognized Imperial Britain as a morally legitimate uh, world structure, political structure, that was worth upholding because it provided something that not having it didn't have. It provided a certain standard of living, a quality of life, the rule of law, like f uh, fair justice, uncorrupted institutions like there is actually a lot in the british identity that isn't just merely ethnic particularity right no so, I, but, but, but i have well, i have some quibbles here uh, sure, sure. carl like uh i i so so this kind of brings us full circle back to tucker carlson hmm. uh, the, the now, now there are two modes that kind of in my mind, bind a uh, pull us together. The first one mm -hmm. is ethnos. The other one is religion. Yeah. And I think the stronger one is religion. And we can argue about what that, and I have a broad view of that. I think most ideologies are religions. Um, but but what we're really talking about when we talk about of the binding together of a polis or a demos or a people it is goes back to the noblesse oblige thing, right? And, and you know, the, what will bind you together is the exact same thing the exact same emotion that when you look at somebody else, you you feel instinctively uh, that that the, a they are noble and that they, that their instincts are leading them in a noble direction that is true, good, and beautiful, mm -hmm. and b that that this common sense of 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 purpose, whether it extends from an ideological religious basis or whether it extends from a common ethnos, this will bind you in a reciprocal relationship so that they'll be obliged to actually help you mm -hmm. and and be your representative in nobility. Mm -hmm. And what's so essential about this relationship, and it is not that it's not that Could it, we summarize it as just a relationship of honor it's a relationship of honor yeah absolutely yeah but mm -hmm. but the, the important thing is not that it takes upon itself certain words for instance you have to believe in human rights or you have to believe in the constitution or you have to believe in 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 the decency of all men or something like that like these are just words mm -hmm. uh, what what matters is that the the people who speak them actually believe that mm -hmm. that there that there is this esoteric sacredness to these words yeah. and, and once that sacredness is gone then you know i i don't understand what what even is is the relationship becomes a hollow procedural thing it, all it means then is you're you're attached to your bureaucracy and they have to fill out the human rights b152 form section c6 and submit that but other than the fact that they stamp the right human rights form they don't actually believe in the common spirit that unites you at your core Hmm. Uh, and, and that's that's essentially what this has become. All of these platitudes about loyalty have become essentially procedural managerial elements, and there's yeah. no spirit in them. I don't doubt that this woman's uh, parents, uh, you know, bent a knee to the British Empire 60 years ago. Uh, but I, I, I definitely, first of all, I even doubt that her grandparents believed in the majesty of the British Empire. Although I do believe they thought it was efficient and, and no, no, hang, stuff. hang on, hang on. And, Let me push back yeah. on that. There, there, are, there is definitely that. Maybe not now, obviously. Yeah. But does she um, believe it now? Right? No, no, she doesn't believe it now, obviously. But there, there, there definitely is in some elements of Indian society um, a holdover uh, legacy imperial dream that is believed in that is believed in the magic and my my friend i didn't when i was a teenager obviously i had no conception of this because we we're all you know british uh, but his dad was indian and he adored the british empire he adored it he had so much so many just books and uh like um photographic tomes of british battleships and things like this like and there, there, there is in certain mm -hmm. elements of Indian society um, a, an adoration and for the majesty of what Britain was at its peak. Uh, there, yeah. there really is, and, and it's not just the power or the prestige; 
It's also the way things were done. Like the lack of corruption is a genuinely English perspective that was, that was something that was really well respected. And George Orwell sh talks about this in Shooting an Elephant when he was a governor in Burma. Um, the, the, he was expected to fulfill a role and his face, he, he had to wear a mask and his face grew to fit the mask, right? He felt mm -hmm. like he had to be the noble white colonial overlord, whether he wanted to be or not, right? There was a, a pressure there. And there were people who did look up to that. Um, and so it's it's not that there isn't, in some areas, possibly a lot less now, that there wasn't any appreciation of actually the majesty. And I, I, I saw a thing by an Indian the other day where they said, that their grandparents were like, oh, I tell you what, the British Empire might have been racist, but at least it was safe to walk the streets mm -hmm. in India. And it's like, and so, like, and there was another clip as well of this English tourist wandering around India. And some guy's like, oh, English, come back and rule us, come back and rule us. Like, it's, it's, it's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, it's really funny uh, because there was majesty there. Right. There was there was genuine old. Well, there's genuine aristocracy, majesty. right? I mean, it, anyone will naturally gravitate to an aristocratic spirit. A a absolutely, and we we can see this manifested in the last, in in a, in peoples like the Sikhs and the Gurkhas, who the Sikhs are unrepentant English nationalists for the most part. It seems right. It's yeah, actually kind of warrior weird. caste. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But and and so same with the Nepalese, the Gurkhas, right? Like England yeah, exactly, is right? most of Nepal's economy through the Gurkhas. We still recruit to the British Army, and being an army brat, I can tell you, man, everyone in the army looks up to the Gurkhas, right? It's a mm -hmm. genuinely heroic, noble, honourable position that they hold, and so they seem to be genuinely loyal to Britain, and the Sikhs seem to have very much the same opinion of England generally, right? Like I've seen so many, like literally about a dozen stories of Sikh India English nationalism. It's kind of weird, right? It's actually like, I, you know, I'm not this patriotic. What the hell is going on, right? And so it, there, there is a genuine, inscribed in the hearts, love of what England and Britain used to be, right? And it actually is kind of annoying that we can't, in, like lean into it like orwell said can't can't our faces grow to fit the mask please you know and so it's it's not like in america where you guys have this very thin social contract that is literally just a legalistic you know you you'll sit over there and not bother me and i'll sit over here and i'll do my thing and then we'll we'll, we'll engage in a contract it, it britain was an old world country it wasn't a social contract country and so there was this majesty and prestige and it does still linger in places but it's very much on it on it's you know it's it's not something you can pull on like it's not a, a, a string you can tug to to make the world move anymore right the magic of it is very very loose and faded and uh leaving the memory of present generations i mean this is why you're kind of harping on one of the reasons why i'm very sympathetic to monarchism because mm. and this is one of the reasons why the woke monarchy is i mean I, this yeah, is you can, sad, you can almost you can see no but you you could you could the, 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 there's one difference the constitution took on religious connotations while the elite was trying to do this project where they had a unified culture for america basically post 1865 the constitution and the things like the flag and most of our patriotic songs come from this like late 19th century period where the federal government is 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 very consciously trying to destroy regional identities. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the Constitution is, is, despite what some progressive justices might think, dead. It's a, it's a piece of paper. The, the, the England, England and monarchies, and this is why restoration, at least, it, well, for people who believe in the cycle of history, mm -hmm. uh, restoration and, and Promethean new societies always come from the form of a monarchy. Because mm -hmm. if, for instance, you had an incredibly based king. The the no, problems you're that. suffering in England would almost yeah. instantly be yeah. over. Uh, the, the 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 ways he could move, the things he could do, the <sighs> things he could say, would uh, immediately upset the the managerial yeah. class and discredit them. And the the position and of the king would be unassailable as well, right? Because yeah, and you have legality on your side too, right? But it's it's not just that. You could see it in the Queen's funeral, man. Yeah. Like 
Peter Hitchens was just on the radio being like, this is the deep magic of Britain at work. And you could see, you could see there was like these ley lines of, of genuine glowing magic across the streets. And they've been laying there dormant and suddenly they were all taut and the entire thing was moving. And literally just English people, you know, rose up to do this thing that lasted for only a short period of time. But in that time, man, everything else went quiet. Mm -hmm. You could feel it. That this is it's on the march. Ever, and it was the most watched thing in all of human history, the Queen's funeral, right? Oh, yeah. Like the, and my my and wife it, watched it. Yeah, like it's it literally billions of people around the world watched this live. And it was just like, okay, there is some genuine magic here. Like I actually start the thing. Well, no, no, I think magic is actually real. And I think that this is a facet of monarchy actually yeah, my, my wife considers herself a subject of of the, th the crown <laughs> uh, she's funny the crown right? considered itself a legitimate institution yeah. eh? no, but, i mean but this is this yeah. is the thing right i mean it would, it would immediately yeah. solve i mean it wouldn't solve your ultimate multiculturalism problem right because uh you know, hindu you know hindus would still be hindus muslims would still be muslims and english would still be english right uh, but it would immediately solve your near-term political crisis because it would be very it with with sort of a based king it would be like okay are you kneeling or you're not right yeah. here's the point of decision right and you're, you're either kneeling and submitting to the will of of this person who embodies the the idea mm -hmm. of the, the country in which case you are politically with us or you know you really shouldn't be here and and that would immediately solve solve the political problem. And, and there's there's sort of a restoration that comes from this. But I I think that the royalty is just so far away from producing a man like that. Uh, the the the, yeah. the the whole form of our society is just and and I don't want to like put down King Charles at all, you know. But feel the, free. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not under any obligation. I'm not Canadian. <laughs> Look, I'm but, English and it pisses me off, you know. Yeah, this is this is probably a bad time to say that I, I really do think that House Stewart should be, uh, you know, on the throne. But I'll, I'll leave it aside. Um, you know, they're, <laughs> they're they're still ruling in Luxembourg. You can still snag a few if you, you want to switch yeah, back, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Or or is it is it Liechtenstein? I can never keep track. Uh, yeah, but uh, the 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 thing is is that, and this is you know this is what I uh, I, I also kind of wanted to talk about, and I've been I've been on this sort of track for for a year i mm -hmm. think that what we're seeing right now is not so much a conflict between left and right but a conflict between reality and the people who live in reality and the people who live in 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 parasocial reality as kind of elements of 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 of, of some kind of AI generated play space. Mm. And uh, ever, the more and more I look at it, the, I'm not saying that that's an untouched but the left and right distinction, especially mm. in, in this country. I get the sense mm. that in a, in a lot of ways, the people who are deepest into the left wing stuff uh, are, are sort of radically detached from reality in a way that even an extremely online right winger like myself could never even understand. Yeah, and um, you know this this is more and more how I'm I'm seeing things, and and, and there, it seems like every single story I look at, um, you know, from this recent Stephen Crowder drama to the stuff having to do with artificial intelligence, to the stuff having to do with with Tucker Carlson and mm -hmm. the general pessimism about the world, it is just this this question of like whether we want to survive as a species in reality, or whether we get sort of further sucked into the Skinner box and. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of how I see things playing out again and again. And and you know to link it back to the previous thing, you know can can we generate sort of a noble understanding of ourselves uh, mm -hmm. where we could actually be ruled by people in, in reality who, who who have our best interests at heart? And and could we yeah. believe in that again? So one one thing, the, the, I, the, I'm glad we're having this conversation because this is crystallizing what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make it clear: I'm not actually optimistic about any of the things I'm really saying here. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is these things do exist still, right? So yeah. it's because a lot of the time there's, a, you know, everyone's black pilled. It's over. It's over. It's never been more over than it is now. And, but really under the surface, the deep magic does still exist actually. And we just need to learn how to sing its songs to, to summon it. Right. Yeah. And, this is why the guy just waving his England flag saying England great 
simple as is that that's him he's standing on the deep magic there right and it worked right it literally you know it worked millions of people saw that him winning the argument on just this is what i believe and i'm not moving from this position and i see in the reaction to tucker carlson being fired the same kind of deep magic right and this is what the americans need to be able to find the root of and bring to the surface right and this is what tucker was good at speaking in this magical way that yeah. actually he does care and you are worthy of being cared about and therefore he's worthy of being supported right and so you can feel the magical bonds connecting tucker and people like us people who like it like literally all of the right actually like it's weird the, the genuine warmth and sympathy mm -hmm. to tucker that has come from just i mean like <laughs> him being fired is nothing <laughs> like yeah. he got like 20 million dollars a year he has a bank account doubtless because he's he's probably not a big spender you know he's what i mean heir, probably, right you know yeah, right he's he not to begin with yeah exactly he's not you know it, but things he personally is not like a, a an extravagant man right yeah. like you see the video of him fly fishing or whatever well that's something anyone can do you know you don't have mm. to be a multi-millionaire to fly fish you know he's not on a private yacht in the caribbean i mean maybe he has one i don't know but he's doubtless sat, sat on a stack of unbelievable cash and it doesn't preoccupy him right so him being fired if i if you know if i lost my business if you got fired from your job we'd have yeah. very pragmatic concerns about where money is coming from of course I yeah much, but like, I, I assume you know you do who knows you might be an heir to something no um, i'm not i'm not an heir to anything <laughs> i don't i don't know either. another yeah, I'm, I'm an heir to the uh something something california fortune or whatever right yeah but well you but hey i i don't know right? I, I you know i, I might I, I have a line that goes back very far in california and my and my my parents did make a lot of money on inheriting a a house in san francisco I'm not, that I'm was not a good of it i'm not judging right yeah yeah it, it, there's nothing wrong with inheriting right there's nothing wrong with passing down the accumulated wealth of generations. That's what I'm trying to do for my children, you know? Mm. Um, and that's what my dad has tried to do for me. And it's just that we started in a very poor place, right? But we're not in a very poor place now because we're doing the right things to make sure this is not something that our grandkids will have a problem with, right? But the, but the point I'm making is that Tucker, it was not a practical concern that people have for Tucker, right? If when I get demonetized and a bunch of people sign up to lotuses.com, that's a practical concern people have out of care of me. And I really appreciate it. I, you know, it's very heartening that when we got demonetized, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people signed up and have stayed signed up out of love of us, right? And so that's very heartening. And so with, with Tucker, it's the it's genuinely a bond of sentiment that people have for him. It, they're, con they're, they're not even they're not even concerned about his reach right his reach is probably not going to go down significantly yeah. like if, if that clip is anything 72 million impressions and like 20 million actual views on the video yeah. oh my god you know it, it shows the totemic power of tucker and what he represents what he makes present in himself when he's dealing with political subjects you know a genuine magical kind of american like, honestly the american that we used to respect like the Americans that we used to like, like the noble and honorable and decent Americans who are actually worthy of being considered to be good friends, right? We used to have mm -hmm. like this view of Americans like that. Now, this interestingly ties in with the death of Jerry Springer, right? Well, yeah, actually, I'm glad you, well, I kind of wanted to start here, but I, 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 I very much agree with your tweet about, I mean, do, do you know his history? As, like, not well, history? not well. I just he, remember he was, an, he was an aide to the Kennedy family in the 1960s before oh, really? they were assassinated. And then he started, he started his own political career trying to be his own version of the Kennedys. And then he got caught paying for a prostitute with a check. And uh, then he reemerged as, as this sort of trash television personality. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, 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 it, to me, it's very important to understand that he was shooting to be the next John F. Kennedy, and he ended up being uh, the king of trash. Yeah, uh, because in, in so many different ways, we live in Jerry Springer's America. It, yes. It's the it's the, it's it's the it's the politics of spectacle played out again and again. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's the description of clown world, I would say, right? 
it, it's embarrassing to me to see people lamenting the death of Jerry Springer. Oh, he was such a great American television icon. I'm old enough to remember when Jerry Springer, Springer became big over here, mm -hmm. and in an, you know in this sort of international community, I guess you could say. And he was viewed with contempt and disgust for what he did for his yeah. job. Like it is a disgusting thing that Jerry Springer does. And Maury Povich and uh, Jeremy Kyle in Britain is a copy, a carbon copy of these things. And any decent person views him with absolute contempt and disgust because what he's doing is shoveling absolute bullshit into the living room of anyone who is stupid enough to watch it, humiliating the lowest people in the in the country who need help, who need to be supported, who need a good example, and feeding them back the worst examples for them to imitate. My family is very yeah. working class. I have lots of friends who are very working class. They're still very, you know, low to the nose to the grindstone, you know, in 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 the real world. And I always have my whole life. And I remember when I was in my 20s, like having, you know, I was a stoner, I was a dropout. And I would be hanging out with these people who'd wish they could get on Jeremy Kyle. And it's just like, <laughs> are you fucking mad? You know, because they would be famous in their little circle of friends. Yeah being a loser who got on jerry Kyle, and it was just like this is the most enervating disgusting thing i've ever seen you know it was genuine i genuinely found it to be and this i think is when i think it's jeremy uh, jerry springer who really poisoned the international reputation of american culture right because before then american culture was fairly well respected it wasn't disgusting you didn't just spread rubbish everywhere Right. It, it was... I, I I think I think that you I I think that I'm I might say that though that we, we just hid the rubbish better behind hey better hey, products. That, that's fine. That's t I'm doubtless totally true, right? But I'm not an American. I, I so think the I'll, French I'll... were on to us early back in the '50s, where they they smashed Coca-Cola <laughs> bottles to protect their wine industry. Uh, the, 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 yeah, but the French have been like this for everyone forever, right? Um, <laughs> but the in in the in England, it was very obviously there was a change in tenor in american culture that really became noticeable with jerry springer right because before then american i'm sure that as an insider to american culture you can say well we had these things but they didn't leak out you know these may you know everyone's got their sort of parochial bullshit but this became like a worldwide phenomenon and everyone started associating this with americanism and that's in my opinion and maybe it's just me having a strange sort of anti-rose tinted glass uh, glasses when I'm thinking back on it. <coughs> but I you know, remember, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hook the, these disparate elements together because I'm yeah, a schizophrenic on. and that's what I do. Hmm. But let's talk about tabloids and the moment I think that changed everything, which is the death of princess Diana, which is sort of the intersection. Um, let's examine Prince like, the royalty of Princess Diana, which I actually don't really like her personally, but as an example, she's she's good because she had a huge working class appeal, mm. and she was a noble, and uh, and she was also a noble that did for many people what uh, what the um, what what nobility actually or part of the things that nobility is actually supposed to do. So imagine like your average trash television consumer. Uh, you know, they, they see the queen and like all the generations before them, they feel good about themselves because they feel like their lives are aspirational imitations of the queen. They're mm. British, they're Anglican. They have, they have sensible, they speak the queen's English. They probably don't speak the queen's English, but they aspire to speak. The they queen's respect English. that there are people you know, that do speak the queen's English. They, they celebrate tea like the queen and because that's what a British person do. And the queen's life which I will superimpose Princess Diana's life as the tabloid version of the Queen's life yeah. was a symbol of an aspiration. And you feel good of your, about yourself because you are an imitation of the aspirational image. Jerry Springer is the chaotic shadow of that that has mm. now seen new life in the internet where you go home and you feel good because you're watching people who are worse than you. 
Uh, and the the entire and this, this is what the, the the iPhone killed Jerry Springer because now we have TikTok, right? But we 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 watch these things and we feel good about ourselves because we see what we shouldn't become, uh, because we see sort of the, the 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 dregs of society, and so the aspirational impulse has been has been facilitated by this sort of narcissistic impulse. And there's nothing people think that narcissists are egoists. Uh, but but really, you know, what what characterizes a narcissist more than greed is the desire to see everyone else kind of put down around them. Yeah, it's uh, insecurity, isn't it? Exactly right. Yeah. The, it, it, it's, it's actually a, a huge insecurity, and yeah. the emotion that's most characteristic of narcissism, in my opinion, and I'm not saying this as a psychological professional about clinical narcissism, but I'm saying this as a as someone who kind of encounter narcissistic personalities is <laughs> they 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 want to see people put down and destroyed mm -hmm. and and what jerry springer did was fed our narcissism collectively and, and so much of everything we consume right now from technology is just doing the exact same thing the the it's interesting you bring up princess diana actually because um there is definitely something in the 90s that happened where we we can just call it like trash culture mm -hmm. became the mainstream right and princess diana peter hitchens is scathing about princess diana uh, and has some really good takes on her um but one of the takes that he had was the hollowness of the uh people's princess yeah. i remember very clearly when princess diana died i think it was about 18 or 19 and uh i just remember it being on tv constantly because of course we didn't have mobile phones then um and i didn't care at all yeah. Neither did my parents. Neither did my neighbors. Neither did any of my friends. We didn't talk about it. It was just a media trash projection, right? And that, and the 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 sort of current thingist before the current thing was a yeah. thing. She was a she was a phenomena of that, right? Where she had a very crafted political image by favorable media outlets, but never lived in the hearts of the people. Whereas, well, there was a transition where she went from being an actual noble when she was mm -hmm. married to Charles to being like yeah. this celebrity who was famous for being famous. Yeah. But and, also adversarial to the the crown. And yeah. That's never been accepted by the English. You know, and and that, that's also something is that she somehow seemed to get more popular the, the more she kind of moved out in opposition to what she should have represented. Yeah, what but she should have represented with... is is unity and and, and a common British life, yes. and the media pumped her up at the very moment where she represented the destruction or deconstruction of that principle in exactly the same way of Meghan Markle. And yeah, actually, so... that's she's very much you yeah. know, you you can I... see sort of the the two sides of of that kind of coming to the fore, right? And I think I think what the British public recognized is what this is is the attempt to construct a rival moral power structure in competition with the crown and and i, I mostly it's the english who just won't have this they mm -hmm. just won't have this uh, and this is why people hate Meghan markle this is why when jeremy clarkson's like look i hate Meghan markle i won't see her lashed through the streets <laughs> he feels that way because he can see that there's a rival power structure to something that is sovereign it is the the very highest and unquestionable power structure and one of the one of the points that Bo and i make on uh, epochs his history series on mostseries.com all the time is can you in your wildest dreams imagine that after defeating napoleon at waterloo the duke of wellington comes back and tries to install himself as king yeah that's <laughs> it sounds preposterous it does not in a million years no one even thinks about it but that that's the moral level on which the king had his authority right mm -hmm. the greatest general of the era with the most loyal army behind him coming off the greatest victory would not have even countenance the idea of it it would have been preposterous he would he would have probably if you'd suggested it he probably would have hanged you as a traitor yeah right and and this is the the importance that the monarchy has in the boomer generation of Jeremy Clarkson. And when he was like, well, everyone agrees. I mean, they literally polled, and it was literally like 90% of boomers agreed. She should be lashed through the streets for daring to challenge the queen's authority as the moral power of the country. 
Like, and, th- and this is yeah. what Diana did, and this is why she was never really loved by the British. She was loved by the, you know, the Westminster intelligentsia because of the progressive things that she advocated and what she, the opposition she could provide. But Markle is the same. Everyone, like the Americans are, oh, well, they're just racist. Oh, shut up. You know, shut up. It, oh, it's not racism. Everyone but, knows it's not racism because she's obviously white, but also yeah, yeah, it, she does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's just so, if you didn't tell me she had a black grandparent, she's like me. She's literally as yeah. like she's got literally my <laughs> my ethnic makeup sort of thing. If you didn't tell me, we wouldn't know. And also, she's challenging the moral authority of the queen. That's what this is, right? And that's what this has always been. How dare you attack the royal family and the institution of the crown? That's what it is. And the, the boom It's not surprising that she's woke either, right? Because she comes oh, yeah. bearing the successor ideology. Yeah. And, and in the event that, you know, the nightmare scenario where where, where that side ends up on the throne. I mean, the, the point would not be to facilitate a king. The point would be to sort of create a, a, a kind of ridiculous yeah. parody of the monarchy that nobody in their right mind could believe in. And yes. I keep on sounding like a broken drum, you know, or like the the Primarch Lorgar from Warhammer 40k. But I mean, it's true. Like this is a war over belief, and the yeah. the entire object, the the struggle that we have as as dissidents to this new world order, is not to. It's almost like we're not really fighting against another vision of the future for humanity. We're fighting against the negation of any vision of the future of her yeah. humanity. Uh, nobody really believes trans women are women. Uh, nobody really believes that uh, that this that that half Careful of these things that go on, yeah, that yeah, yeah, that, yeah that Black Lives Matter actually cares about Black Lives. That. Yeah half of these things that but we have to it's the facade right the facade of power demands that we say these ridiculous contradictory things Mm -hmm. that we kneel before these hollow idols and and that we take the the few pieces of religiosity and meaning and ethnicity and hollow them out uh it wants us to bow before these false things because Mm. it wants a, it wants a population that literally Mm. is fake in its belief system from top to bottom. And once a person genuinely has nothing real that they believe in or believes in a set of things that they know from the outset or only lies, uh, power can do whatever it wants because nobody will ever, you know, this is like the inversion of the John Lennon song. Once there's nothing to live or die for, once there's something to live or die for, okay, maybe we all go smoke pot in John Lennon's imagined world. But what really it means is once there's nothing to live or die for, power has free range to invent its own reality. Mm. And, and, and because it could suggest at any moment that maybe it's better to kill yourself or maybe it's better to see the extinction of your family or your religion in the future and that you should resign yourself to that for the enrichment of whatever individual key performance metric it's decided this week is going to be the new thing we all have to run after. And literally if you don't believe in anything solid, system. you'll do it. What? Yeah. yeah, literally the Canadian health system at this point. <laughs> but it's on our own. I just can't yeah. get over how I mean, it, it is profoundly evil that for the efficiency's sake, they recommend, why don't you kill yourself? Like It's just, but this yeah. is literally an entire country, a modern first world country is doing this. But and they've been doing, they've been doing that. Like, I, if you look at this in a broader sense of, of collectivity, right? When they mm-hmm. suggest that you should sterilize yourself and not have children, oh, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. asking you to do a similar thing. Uh, when, when they when they when they ask you to take the real things you believe in and replace them with with hollow symbols, they're they're killing you at, in piecemeal every day. Every time you exchange something real for something fake, you are in a sense killing yourself and uh, your soul. And I don't mean to bring spirituality. Why? Well, obviously, no, no, I believe in spirituality. it's not inappropriate to bring up yeah. spirituality. That do- that doesn't necessarily mean God. That's the thing. It doesn't necessarily mean Christian dogma. Well, it, like, it, it does mean God. Of course in, in it my does. Opinion. <laughs> of course it does. But, but, but no, 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 is, no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. bigger than Christian no. dogma, though. Yeah. No, no, but I, I I, don't agree. I think that there is a more broad t- use of the term spirituality that is what we are seeing um, play out. Now, obviously, from your point of view. Behind, uh, yeah. Behind there's every a, there's person's a, there's a, mind, well, no, but, but, no, there's no, a but reason to live view. and die for. That reason yeah. is God. <laughs> You but, can call okay, whatever you want. For, sure. And, uh, you know, for the well-educated Catholic theocrat, yes, right? I appreciate your position. Um, 
but there is a uh, spirituality more broadly which yeah like you say it's what moves the hearts of men right and there are there are things that are not necessarily religious that we will also call spiritual thomas skinner waving his england flag was a spiritual experience for me and i think him as well mm -hmm. like and i think it was a genuinely spiritual thing it's like no we do, this is beyond argument we don't care what you're saying we believe in england and I see the same sort of thing happening with Tucker Carlson, man. There is a genuine belief in the rightness of his cause and yeah. the rightness of the right man to lead the cause. That is the, the again, the magic. I can see the magic happening or, or, in front or the, of us. Or the magic of a few years ago when you saw all those French people singing in front of the burning image of Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. These, these are all the common yeah. emotions. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem is that they all have sort of this really, I know I'm not trying to be black pilled about this, Carl, but I'm not, I'm there, not, there's, not there's a re, these, these spiritual moments are happening all in the same way, which yeah. is we, we understand when we, when we see the thing dying, what it meant in the rear view mirror, but mm. the, the whole structure of society is preventing us from actually uh, embracing uh, the thing of this emotion while it's living in front of us. And I agree. I completely agree. The, the The question is how to recall the rights that summon the imminent transcendence into being, right? How and we 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 can see. Okay, when the queen dies, boom. There's a there's a vast amount of spiritual power that's unleashed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's there, right? It exists, and it's possible to manifest it in reality. Okay, that's great. You know, that's good. Um, how we, we need the proper language that makes people act proactively to construct the spiritual order, right? Again, not necessarily the religious order, but the order they genuinely believe in, that they, they will actually fight for. Right, we we have definitely lost these tools. Now, like I said, I'm not I'm not optimistic about this. Right, I'm mm -hmm. just I think that this is the genuine great struggle of our time. What we are actually battling against, because the materialistic forces of what we'll just call the left broadly that are erasing and degrading us every day, that have been doing this our whole lives, man, our whole lives. This has been happening to people of our age, and I mean the poor fucking zoomers, man. The millennials are totally lost, but the poor fucking yeah. Zoomers who are just, you know, the millennials at least kind of hate, right? There's a kind of hatred. It's like, look, I was let down by the spiritual promises of the civilization that preceded yeah. us. And so at least I can fucking destroy it, right? At least I can really give myself to the gods of chaos. You know, I can, yeah. I can become the worst Slaneshi cultist. I can become... <laughs> The, uh, no, no, that's that's genuinely what they're doing. That's and I mean, genuinely... that, that's that's what you saw in contra, in contrapoints, like the released a video Absolutely. this last week, right? And you see, yeah. I mean, it, you know, but, uh, contrapoints is really like the perfect millennial yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah. It, it just the the entire arc, you know, mm -hmm. uh, do a bunch of stuff, get famous on YouTube, and then stop making YouTube videos. Yeah, and, and they and know you... they they know she knows that this is just wrong. She knows that what she's doing is wrong. Yeah, but deep level. Contrapoints literally writes that into their videos. If you read the yeah. subtext, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, look, exactly, Ex exactly. Like the, the 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 aesthetic, the framing, the kind of disappointment, and it, the, there's a kind of melancholy that and s cynicism that underpins every contrapoints video. And I watch them obviously, like you do, you know, because mm -hmm. you know with this kind of eye, and it always comes down to essentially a kind of disappointment in the promises unfulfilled, you know? Yeah. And so it justifies me being the chaos cultist. And it's like, and I'm going to be the worst chaos cultist you've ever seen. And I'm well, going to pervert an entire generation of online millennials. Like, okay. Okay. You know, that's, that's, you can do that. That is true. Well, can, you know, can, you, can contrapoints because this is sort of one of the great ironies of contrapoints <sighs> later career is that, uh, they it's very obvious that the the position that they saw themselves in was not the position they occupied they thought that this whole trans stuff would make them a, a countercultural figure forever yeah. uh, you know yeah. one of the kind person who did this and uh they got the clout but then they got too much clout to the point where they're an institution now 
Uh, ContraPoints yeah. is something that other channels copy to kind of sometimes yeah. ridiculous degrees. If you mm -hmm. know the if, if you're you follow philosophy, philosophy tube, tube, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like now, ContraPoints is an institution, and mm. the entire meaning that the early ContraPoints videos had, and the vast—I mean, I didn't agree with them back then either, but there was a vivacity and an energy to it that was deconstructive, yeah. 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 but. But the thing, this is what, what all kind of chaotic forces kind of do is, is chaotic forces thrive on releasing energy from dissolution, yeah. right? So once, yeah. the, once the reality has burned around or uh, has burnt down around them, uh, yeah. the, the chaotic energy can't exist anymore and it kind of yeah. gets absorbed into nothingness. And, you know, I, I feel really sorry for Natalie when, because I see them and, and it's, it's very obvious that they're not passionate about this. There it's very obvious that they feel obligated. They feel obligated. They feel obligated to make these videos because they know that an enormous number of people followed them. Yeah. And if there is one thing that I would say motivates Natalie Wynn, what gets them up in the middle of the day is like, okay, I did this and a bunch of people followed me. And every time you attack this community, you're attacking the people that believe me. And hey, maybe I don't even really believe this stuff 100% anymore. But but I don't want to leave the people who followed me behind in this note. So I have to make a video, even though I don't really believe this. It's difficult and, absconding a great position like that. Yeah, that they've, they've, she, she's found herself in. I'm going to say she, just to be polite. You know, obviously, um, <laughs> I, I try to avoid pronouns as much as possible. Yeah, I know, and I always get it in the neck from right wingers, and it's like, look, man, <laughs> you know, if 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 he he had a beard, then sure, I would say he. Okay, but yeah. look, let's just be polite for now. Okay, well, okay. I, I I use I use he in the past tense though, but because because sure uh, in the past yeah, they, tense, yeah, yeah you could. Um, but, but anyway, you are, you're, you're I, totally I avoid, right. Yeah. Go ahead. You're to you're totally right about like the destructive nature of chaos. Now, Natalie has found herself uh, a very effective tool in the chaos arsenal to destroy the order that came before, and mm -hmm. at points she definitely relished it, and her audience relished it, and I I think that. Natalie has created a lot of trans people, actually, you know, like literally probably thousands of trans people. Uh, yeah, but everything think, was going in this direction already, you know? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. I'm not, I'm not like, yeah, I'm not saying she's the origin point of yeah. this or anything like that, but her influence would have tipped a bunch of people over the edge. Go, no, I am going to, I am going to do it. You know, look, I could be like my hero, you know, ContraPoints, right? I bet there's a lot of people like that. And but this is the thing, though, well, the tragedy is that the the legend of natalie Wynn is something that can only exist on the internet yes and the thing is i think this i know is sort you of authentically at that right because even even yeah. the belief she seems to express in the rightness of her cause is always underpinned by a slight sarcasm a yeah. slight insincerity and there was a video she made a, f a year a few years ago now that she was critiquing something and She's looked at the camera and go, why am I an SJW again? You know, and it was just, and it was just that, that little tiny, I've never, ever had that kind of little sarcastic look at the camera and been like, why do I oppose social justice again? That's <laughs> ne never. I've never had a moment of doubt, a, 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 fr a fraction of c loss of conviction, right? And I've never revealed it. If I, you know, I've never had, but I wouldn't reveal it if I did, right? Just being sensible. And this, this is obviously ironic. It's an obvious ironic thing to say. But yeah, it's irony, there's not something irony. There. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's it's ironic, but the point was true, right? Like the, the SJWs were being annoying whiny bitches. And she's like, why am I on their side again? And so there's there there is something inauthentic that underpins all of ContraPoint's videos. And so this this I I do genuinely think that like coming back to the sort of 40k analogy, the problem that she's facing is that essentially there are now millions of people who are expecting her to set the world order, right? To set yeah. the moral order of the new paradigm. And my God, it, you know, imagine being like, look, I was just here to destroy. You know, I was just here to destroy. And now you've got millions of people saying, look, show us the way, be our prophet, you know, the new order. I'm not surprised Natalie doesn't want to make videos and doesn't enjoy making videos because yeah. she obviously doesn't know what she's supposed to do. And oh, like, no. And and they're all subjects of don't cancel me, right? The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The... I'm afraid of the giant mob that I have amassed that is looking for guidance and i it's a very it's a tightrope you know put put a put a step wrong and boom you're into the boiling pit of lava aren't you 
Well, I mean that this is sort of it's very interesting that that I obviously there were there are about there were about 15 interesting minutes of that two hour video that ContraPoints yeah. made, but they and it was mainly just its existence that was interesting. But another thing that was interesting about that was was the fact that the subject of her video was that a woman who had left the Westboro Baptist Church, right? Mm -hmm. So so you have sort of like this 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 kind of ridiculous Baptist church that, you know, really would be more at home in like the, the 1920s and the 2020s. Yeah. And, and this sort of this, this refugees from the land that time forgot uh, crossing paths with this person from the end of time going on the opposite direction. There's mm -hmm. this French Turner phrase that I, I, I need to figure this out uh, because I I've used this with myself with, with, uh, with with the character from 40k I mentioned continuously Lorgar there, mm. there's this French term I don't know what it is it's called it's this term for when two objects are going in the opposite direction and they pass each other and for a brief moment they share the same reality mm. um and, and and this is sort of what you you see with these characters is that um it, it is and I don't exactly know what the the the, the process of these people is going to be. Uh, but but you see sort of like a true believer leaving a, a pre-modern religion, and, and then you see another person who's who's come to the end of the secularization process and is kind of left with nothing, and, mm -hmm. and they're kind of looking at each other in total disbelief because there's no point of common reference they have at all. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly where to go go from there, right? I I, I I genuinely am kind of curious about about where this is this can this can take, where where this the sort of narrative can can evolve into. Well, this is brings me back to the point I was going to make about the Zoomers, right? Mm -hmm. And because at least ContraPoints being like the platonic form of a millennial, uh, being relishing the destruction, but being left completely empty and hollow and addicted to opiates and whatever, right? Um, now what? You know, what do you do if you're the generation that find ContraPoints old hat and boring? You know, like, Zoomers are totally lost. They're, they've been totally perverted by the millennials, which is why a quarter of them are gay. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, this is not natural. No one thinks this is natural. You know, they've been, they've had their ability to form in, in proper deep emotional connections totally ravaged by the social contract society in which they live that has all sorts of highly bureaucratic rules of engagement between two people, right? It's it's really quite an evil thing that has happened to them. And I we see them all the time. We see them all the time. And then their TikTok videos and like posts they make on the internet being like, I just don't understand the world. So no, of course you don't. Because the people who came before you deliberately did everything they could to destroy the possibility of you understanding where you belong Mm -hmm. in the great chain of being right and so i do think there is a kind of i don't want to say possibility um because i'm not sure it is possible to salvage these people right i'm not sure that that's the case i'm not sure it's possible mm -hmm. i mean it, it, it's entirely possible like in the same way that i don't feel that i could ever become a religious man right in in when you have been raised and habituated through so many years without a thing that was taken for granted by everyone else in previous generations, I think it's just denied to you, right? But I think it's possible that the Zoomers will wish that they had this. I think they'll feel like they've been denied something when they get a bit older and they're a bit wiser yeah. and they realize that they are actually rightly resentful of the millennials and what the millennials did, that perhaps their children will be raised with something that could be considered to be the Burkean generational contract, you know, like the, the understanding, no, you know, actually I, I'm sick of hating my own country. I'm sick of hating myself. I'm sick of hating everything, you know, and I don't want that for my children. But again, they're only in their early twenties at the moment. So maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe this is not possible. Maybe it's an irredeemable project at this point, And we're just doomed to have this, total collapse i don't know but well i think you know technological development is going to force a, a decision point over yeah. how much you want to follow this stream of fakeness that's coming out of, yeah. of these skinner boxes that we have in our pockets and i mean i think the writing is on the wall that the human race cannot survive without a contact with reality 
And it, there's no way to make this, radical this, statement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's no way to make reality cooler than whatever is going to come out of your screen. Uh, you just have to have something in reality that you actually love. Yeah. And that you love more than the cloud that it can generate. And, you know, I, 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 I'm actually amazed that I can run a YouTube channel because I know that I'm not a cool person at all. And this is the, the problem ultimately with, you know, the left and contrapoints is that they're sort of addicted to this social role and this edgy role that can't possibly be sustained, especially hang in this tour. Hang on, of hang on, hang on. I, I, I take objection to that. Right? <laughs> Why can't you be cool? Okay, I, I'm a dad. Right. And so, dads can't be cool. Come on. Why not? Dads are fucking heroic. <laughs> right. But, but that's it, the thing you're, you're thinking in the old mode, you're thinking that yeah. coolness is a product of, of the 20th century media clout. It, it, it's, 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 it's a function. Well, I mean, unless we're using coolness, like very, very broadly, right. Just to mean someone who's sort of admirable in a way. Why but, is that not, why, why can't we use it like that? Like what, one, one thing, like and I'm I'm serious about the concept mm -hmm. of magic here, right? The 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 spirit that moves men's souls. I do think that if not the Zoomers, then the ones that come after the Zoomers will want something like that because they'll yes. have lived generation after generation in a totally disenchanted world. I think that any charlatan that comes along and says, "Hey, I can I can make you feel, I can make you believe," I I think that they'll be eager for that, and I don't see why not. You know, and all that takes is the ability to articulate a self-confident position and believe it. Right? And well, to believe it is the hard part, right? And, and yeah, live you it. Believe. it. What? You believe. Yes. And there we go. what? There we go. That makes you well, unusual. <laughs> that makes you very unusual, right? You know, I, you know, to, no, no, I, sincerity. I sincerity will be the thing that is difficult to find. It will be a scarce resource in 10 years time to find someone who can genuinely look you in the eye with conviction and say, I believe in X. Like it's genuinely going to be, I could set a moral order with genuine conviction. That's going to be scarce. I think genuine, I think sincerity is cultivated, not born. And I think this is, you know, this is one of the of reasons why a lot of people are thinking in this direction. And, you know, a lot of us, People on the, I don't even know how I want to use the word distant, right? I feel like they just totally lost track of what that even means, yeah. you know, but, but a lot of people in this dissident sphere, mm. uh, myself, myself in particular, are, are constantly trying to push people more into the real world. Uh, mm. The real, it used to be that these dissident ideas were strong online right now. And this revolution really came in 2022, if not mm -hmm. before then. Right now, they really only can be strong or realized in real life. And that's the only solution to sort of this torrent of fakeness that we're experiencing. One one thing I've noticed, though, is when I'm speaking to people who are not millennials, younger than millennials, they are more than happy if you speak to them sincerely about something in a positive way. They seem mm -hmm. to really react well to it. Uh, and I've spoken to a lot, obviously. And I genuinely do think that sincerity and conviction in a true belief is just the winning ticket. It's how we win this. Now, like, like I said, I, you know, this is me outlining the problem. I don't have a solution. I don't have the magic ritual incantation that makes the civilization suddenly march, right? And, and suddenly fix itself. I don't have any of that, but I think this is just the direction we need to go in. And, we, and, if we have confidence in ourselves, a bunch of 19, 20 year olds have nothing. <laughs> like they have literally nothing. They have no knowledge of the world. They have no particular goals. They have no structure. They have no self-confidence. Mm -hmm. We can't fail, right? This is why the dads will win. If we just know how to articulate this and how to popularize this kind of message, the, 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 the mimetic effect of trans women are women, but for our kind of magic right that kind of conquering mimetic narrative like i, said, uh, I, I just i think that the, you know there's an asymmetry here like the mimetic battle will always be won by them uh, it's a tortoise and the hare situation oh. we can't be faster than that what we have to be is we have to be slower and, and more more grounded in, in more and more in contact with something that's permanent but remember they they 
spent a long time working on this. Like this didn't happen overnight. They, you know, it's, it's the work of many hands over many generations that got them to the distilled silver bullet of progressive morality. Um, and, I, and like I said, I'm not saying I've got the answer, but I don't think it's hopeless. I don't think it's over. And mm -hmm. I think that we can shift this. And I know, I, you know, I'm not having, but it's, it's Bo at work. He's constantly like, no, it's not over. We're not having it. We're going on. <laughs> and we're going to do this. And it's like, okay, we might, and it's not going to be us probably, right? It'll probably be generations that come after us, but we're going to be the ones who at least set the groundwork and, and, and hammer in the foundation. And at least we can say, look, the foundation has to be a sincere conviction that we can publicly articulate in the face of a hundred million mocking degenerate millennials, you know, chaos cultists, and just stand there with a chest out and say, no, I don't care. You are all wrong. You are all wrong. The ma I'm standing on the magic, you know, I've got the magic, you've got nothing. And until we can properly do that, yeah, we're going to keep having these losses. But man, I'm telling you, man, I see the magic in the response to Tucker. I saw the magic oh. in the Queen's funeral. The magic, oh, the, still the magic, the magic is always there, hmm. but I just notice it always in this very, very strange particular way. It reminds me of my favorite scene from Lord of the Rings where yes. Frodo and Sam are about to enter Mordor, and they come across the statue of an old king of Gondor that's mm. been decapitated, and this horrific eye has been erected in its place. Mm. And while they're leaving, this kind of, kind of this gruesome scene when you imagine it, right? Like this carved steel eye on a decapitated body. They notice that the uh, the head of the old statue has fallen in the ground and has sort of this this wreath of flowers around it, and, and Frodo cries out as he's leaving the scene you know ev even if sauron wins he can't rule forever right mm. the the chaos will burn itself out and and life and the perennial organic life will return mm. i mean i think that this magic is something that you can see very clearly in recession you can see it very it's very difficult to see it in while it's alive for some for whatever reason but I mean, it's it's always there under the ground. It's always there. Mm -hmm. uh, I should ask you at this point, how much more time do you have? Uh, I we could answer questions, or I could leave you at the two hour mark. Or uh, well, we'll 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 answer questions if you want. So I, I, I hadn't even been thinking about the time. Oh, because uh, I I really I really believe this. I really yeah. believe that there is a magic in what we are defending, and I do think that if we just look people in the eye with conviction and say it with sincerity. They will find themselves sputtering in the face of it. Actually, um, it's just about how to articulate it. But I, let, let's let's answer questions because we probably uh, I don't really have any. I don't think anyone's actually given me. Any. What? Uh, no, 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 no. I, have, I, I use entropy, so I don't think I've Guys. reminded people that that chat's available to them. Chat, but yeah, we we have been spinning gold. Here. Where are you going to get a conversation like this? Where else? And this is not worth anything. For distribute for for Dave's time. Come yeah, on. no, I, I I don't do this. I, I actually intentionally make it hard for my fans to pay me because sure. I, I don't like the transactional nature of opinion giving. Not that I'm saying obviously you have a business. And I'm not trying to poo poo that. No, but, no, I'm, but, I'm, I'm not. I'm not worried about that at all. I, I'm uh, always happy though to promote someone who i think is doing good work and come on guys you've got to support the content creators you like uh yeah yeah but, but i guess on, on a on a last on the last thing you know uh, just to kind of if, if people want to give donations or, or entropy chats i hope it's working i've had a hard time keeping up with this uh the, this this entropy interface isn't always the best for me i should maybe i shouldn't i should chat uh uh this back here i'll put it in here again um and, so uh, quick yeah. couple of things from the chat dave moral mogging carl i don't think i'm having it I don't, i'm, I'm what? not having what's, it. what's what's mogging i mean i i assume it means trying to get me to like uh stand down or something you know to uh, i'm not sure yeah it sounds it sounds like a <laughs> demoralizing I mean, <laughs> i'm not having it i'm not yeah it. i mean i i think that this we're, we're going to see this we're going to see a very strange generational transformation that's mm -hmm. going on and, and you know especially you see this in the changing of the tone on on youtube here 
uh, I, I, I want to know what people kind of are made of when, when the, when the show goes away, when the John Stewart kind of reality of defining yourself by is scoffing, uh, what, what do people actually believe in and what do they want to fight in when, when the chips mm -hmm. are down? And this is something that I think that, that I've gotten a lot more, especially, I feel this, especially just kind of walking around playgrounds with my, my son a lot is kind of just thinking very thinking a lot about just what's left in the earth, what we leave for our children on the earth when everything kind of blows away, because there's, there's so little evidence of what we do online in mm -hmm. the real world. And, and, you know, the real world's kind of been degrading slowly uh, as, mm -hmm. as the conversation goes forward and forward and forward. Well, you're absolutely right. The get, you know, get off the internet, you know, use the internet as little as possible spend your time in the real world i get a lot of this actually uh where i actually I, I tell people look i actually i'm not as online as one might imagine considering i have an online business yeah um, because i have a real life that i have to attend to right and so i can't generally just sit there on my phone with my kids right and so i've got to play with my kids i've got to go outside i've got to speak <laughs> to other parents i've got to go to parties and stuff like this you know with you know kids parties like i'm actually not a terribly online person and this is difficult for people to accept that, you know, but it's true and it's good for me. And so, you know, I, you know, have a healthy complexion, you know, I, I'm not like, you know, indoors all the time. It's not, things are not as bad as you think from the impression that you get online. And this is the thing, and this is why I'm not having it, man. I don't think mm -hmm. it's over. I don't think anything's over. And I do think the situation is recoverable. We just need to know what we're advancing you know, because that's the problem. We're never advancing something in the correct manner. And that's the mission, I think. Oh, your cursed Anglo-Saxon optimism. It's just, it. something is definitely over. Something is definitely, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I just so, think of so, the, so, the California of my youth is over. And, you know, that, I agree, California existed as a separate culture, as a cultural place. Possibly. California existed for a very brief yeah. period of time. Uh, because it was either, so new and everyone there came from somewhere else, but it did exist. And then now it's no longer really what it was before. Now have you it ever, is. Have you ever read the battle of Malden? The battle of no, what is that? It's, a, it's an Anglo-Saxon poem about an Anglo-Saxon defeat to the Vikings. Ah. And even though they're losing, there's a line in there. Look, go look, go look up Scott Mannion on Twitter. This mm -hmm. is a legend. He knows all about this. <laughs> But it's uh, let the the heart grow keener, the eye the eye grow sharper with your diminishing might, right? It's you don't lose, you know. You you might be defeated, but you don't lose, right? And as England has shown, you can come back from a lot, right? I mean, you know, when when six out of seven kingdoms have been conquered by the Danes, and yet we won, it you know, look at the Reconquista. It's not over. Oh, it's not no. over. It's just in, in that sense, it's not over. And right. in the sense of the Reconquista, it's not over. But but I'm I'm just I, I get the sense very definitively that what we need to be kind of looking for a, a new chapter of things. Sure. So we, we need the, the yeah. thing is is that this you know this this stuff, I feel like I'm kind of arguing for the opposite end of, of what I, people think seem to think they know about me. Yeah. But the what 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 children need to know is not that like once there was this thing called the British Empire or once there was this thing called California or the Catholic Church what they need to receive is this is what makes us the thing right now this is what it makes us English What's right now and we're doing magic? it right now and, and, you know, and this and this is what nobility looks like and, and this is our relationship to people who exhibit more nobility than than we and this is mm. what what we do to people who, who have less nobility they need to see things lived because you know this is the great tragedy of uh, and this is my very my big concern with this whole AI stuff is that we're about to be overwhelmed by a torrent of fakeness, yeah. and this torrent of fakeness is going to stand next to everything that's authentic and call it into question. And, and the one thing that it can't generate are things that are are real 
and imminent and, and transcendent all in one moment. Hmm. And, and so, and I don't even, we've been online for so long <laughs> and we've been in this sort of illusion of the 20th century for so long. I don't know what it means to half the things that are in my tradition. I haven't encountered directly in my own life. Hmm. And the thing is, is I don't so much want to read about them more or, you know, expound on how wonderful they were at a previous age. I want to actually mm -hmm. see a, a version, a new version of that thing come into the physical world and exist as something that's holy now. And, yes. and I want to say that like this Sunday, we're going to the holy place. And I, I mean, and I want people to treat it like it's holy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and I want people to act like they respect something that's noble, mm. and, mm. and 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 because it's only in the moment that things ob obtain holiness. And, and the memory, you know, as as a good Catholic, I have to say the memory is in some sense sacred of the holy because we have this tradition of the, the lives of the saints. But but it's it's secondary to the thing as it exists as an element of our lives. Mm. Uh, th this is why we only remember them when they're dead. You only remember you these know, things when they're dead, you know? I always, I always sense an element of melancholy in modern Catholics. Uh, yes, for sure. <laughs> I, I mean, mean no, no, it, John Paul II was the last truly joyous Pope, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and it, I wonder how much that is what you're feeling in your chest, right? Because I'm not a Catholic, and so I'm, I'm not thinking like that. Um, I, I'm I, grievously wounded at what's happened to my country in the way that well, I see, I see the English walking around, man. I see them with their heads down. They're just like a, the defeated people, totally yeah. demoralized, right? I see it when I'm walking around the streets and I'm the only one with my head up, my shoulders back. Right. And I make sure I walk that way because my dad instilled it into me. He made me do this. And he was like, no, this is good for your own self-respect. And looking back, oh my God, it, it, he's totally right. You know? And I, I remember I had a friend who was a few years younger than me when I was about uh, 22. And he, I, and I instilled that into him. And obviously I don't need to instill it in my children. They, they, thankfully they walk with their heads up. But it was just these small things where it's like, no, that's a sincere belief I have. And I will, I mean, I literally essentially commanded my mate to do it. And, but he felt so much better. He felt so much better. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm looking people in the face. He yeah. was also like slumped over and I just sit and I, I'm honestly, I'm so close to just like, oh, walk with your bloody head up. <laughs> you know, you were an Englishman act like it, you know, this, the, the, I'm, I, it's not melancholy that I feel in my chest. It's kind of annoyance actually that we're allowing this to happen. And this was why Tom Skinner waving the flag, just smiling, looking in the eye. It's like, no, I don't care. It's like, this is the, this is the way, this is the energy. Like, no, 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 it's not over. And we're just going to say no, and we're going to start winning. We're going to start taking these things. We're just going to start telling you to get fucked, you know? We're not having any more of this. Now, this is... I, I, will, I will say, I envy you for that one word, Englishman. Uh, <sighs> there's too. no equivalent of it. American, yeah. the problem with the word American is that it's also the name of a government and yeah. a system, and it will always be polluted by that. But the word Englishman... Mm -hmm. Uh, it could never be confused with the government of England and it can right. never be confused with the country, the United Kingdom. Uh, it's got a kind of, it has some kind of allegorical significance to it. And not just yeah. because Gilbert and Sullivan ended their best musical with <laughs> I know that word carried out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Not, the Simpsons also did it. If you want, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how I know it from the sideshow oh. Bob parody. Right? Oh, oh. <laughs> you, um, you've never seen the HMS before. Right. Yeah. Um, but but the, the 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 term Englishman, right? It's not just to be English, right? There there are, it's a multi layered term, and it comes with its significance and a, an obligation to live up to something. Again, it's Orwell's "Your face grows to fit the mask." This and it, this is probably a result of empire that did this to us, you know. But there there was it is yeah, to maybe. be better than just merely a man. Right. There is something in that. And you've got to live up to this. And, you know, you can feel the term pulls you up. And this is why I think that we don't call each other this anymore, because we're afraid of it. I think we're afraid of what it implies. Like you're a steward of England. Look at the state of England now. How yeah. have you been stewarding it? You know, yeah, I, I think I. 
I definitely don't think the Empire did this because uh, I'm reading. You ever heard of the Complete Angler? Uh, no. Oh, you haven't? Oh, no. it's this wonderful book uh, written uh, by Isaac Walton in 1680 something during the yeah. reign of Oliver Cromwell about fishing, yeah. of all things. And it's like this wonderful, like Socratic dialogue that's sort of a tribute to the English countryside and hmm. and and fishing of all things. It's like this, like it's like this classic testament to English leisure. And, and I can tell you, you know, before the English British Empire started properly, there definitely hmm. was a concept of the Englishman that exists hmm. very much in the same way. Um, yeah, I, I plan to do a book group on that with uh, Morgoth from Morgoth Reviews, since he's a, oh, big, I, a fisherman. Can't yeah. wait. I, yeah. I, I, and Mor Morgoth, I saw him using the term Englishman today as well. Um, <laughs> and I've seen others using it. And there's power in the word, man. There's power in it. There's a, It speaks to duty. And this was always the great strength of England, the, mm -hmm. the, the obligation towards duty to one another and the country that being English had within it. And it's, it's there. The magic is there. We just need to know how to activate it. And I, I, I'm glad I'm not a Californian. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, I, Cal California actually <laughs> did. I mean, I say this, th there was a period of American history where yeah. you could be a Californian and, and you know, it, it never meant as much as being a Virginian because mm. Virginian is like the, OG like yeah, regional identity in America, yeah. uh, uh, because it's it's the primary southern state and also the aristocratic state, it, you know, even of the th uh, of um of the entire thirteen colonies. Mm -hmm. But th there was a moment where you could be a Californian, and that actually mm -hmm. meant something. And yeah. uh, you know, it's it's gone. And I, you know, I, my 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 European ethnicity is also another ethnicity. That is gone. I, I'm a child of two dead ethnicities, uh, Californian and uh, Danish, Wavian, German. They, these are both cultures that are dead. Uh, so try maybe, taking maybe pride in the other one. Yeah. My, what? Yeah. Try taking pride in the German heritage. Yeah. <laughs> did the Germans take pride? The Germans no. do not take pride. No, no they it's, it's, it's sad to see it. You know, it's yeah, very it is, sad. Yeah. I lived in um, Germany for eight years. Right. And, oh, you and, did? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I lived in Germany for eight years. And the Germans are lovely people, right? On, on an individual level, they're lovely people, and they're totally scarred by what happened in World War II. Totally yeah. scarred, and it's fucking sad to see. Um, it, it's terrible. It it really yeah. is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not... actually like th there's a lot of banter, obviously, between the European ethnicities, mm -hmm. um, but what underpins all of the banter is the belief that it's legitimate that the other ethnicities take pride in themselves. Yeah. You know? Obviously, I'm going to do down an Irishman or a Frenchman, but I expect them to do me down and take pride in themselves. Yeah, you know? of course. But it's yeah. it's a it's a kind of it's a weird thing that kind of raises everyone up when we do each other down. You know, yeah. it's, it's really weird and it's you know uh, charming, really charming. Like I I tell people that when I went to Oktoberfest in 2009 mm -hmm. and we were on a campsite and it was literally just a mix mm -hmm. mishmash of European ethnicities. Like there's, you know, the, there's French there, there's German there, there's Dutch there. And when we got to the campsite, we just go for a beer and people are like, oh, you're from England. Oh, England. And people were really impressed that we we're English. And I was like, I'd never had this response from anyone before. Right. And there was this Belgian guy and everyone was ragging on him. And I, I was like, no, nah, you know, don't, you know, but the, the whole thing was just really charming, you know, and it was very wholesome that we were all kind of ragging on each other. And yet everyone was having a good time and everyone was very, it was, it was just, and none of us knew each other. It was just a bunch of like 20 something lads kind of bonding over the fact that we're all different, you know, we're all from different European ethnicities. And it was, it was, I, I've, I've got a very positive memory of it. Very positive memory of it. I have to I'm say, you know, well. this, uh, we have, we have some super chats or entropy chats now, uh, Oh, fuck, but finally, but, but the, the thing I want to end with is, you know, it, the there is such thing as ethnogenesis mm. and i think you can see this a little bit in south africa i have a friend conscious caracol who i mm -hmm. own an interview to and what they're developing to sort of survive on the african continent as afrikaners mm. is the kind of thing that i feel is very real and and, and will give 
them sort of an allegorical story to tell themselves, even if they pass through this moment, you know, mm-hmm. when no one knew what it meant to be an Afrikaner. Now, mm-hmm. now they kind of rediscovered themselves. I'm not so sure if there's going to be a new life for Germany, because I feel like the the the, the bureaucratic apparatus of the EU is going to take that country that that entire ethnic identity down with it in flames. <laughs> Uh, it's all, it's know, just negative but... though. Like it's it's really sad because, as an Englishman, and I'm sure f- your average French and Dutch and Belgian and Italian can do the same. We can construct a positive German identity that is not Nazi, obviously. And I, yeah. when I say positive, I don't mean good. I mean um, proactive, basically. Um, that can identify virtues as well as foibles. Uh, that can the Germans could take pride in actually. Um, but the Germans won't allow themselves to do it, right? It's like we we could explain to them what being a German is because we have to, had to deal with Germans, and this is actually one of the things I love when people do it to the English as well, right? When they <clears throat> critique our culture and our habits, like the Germans are incredibly fastidious. The, the culture is, the 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 cities are incredibly clean, or at least they were yeah. when I lived out there. Um, the Germans were were insanely polite, but also very direct, right? They wouldn't like the English have got this habit of telling you a white lie you know, to, to protect your feelings. The Germans are not very good at that. And they're very apologetic that they have to tell you the truth about yourself, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, 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 there's a virtue there. It's noble in a way. Right. And they're reliable. You know, I, I, I find every German friend I had very reliable, you know? And so I, I could construct a very positive German identity if only the Germans were willing to hear it. Right. But well, that's, that's the challenge they always do. Like, say something positive about white people in this country, it's impossible to say something generally positive about yeah. white people. But I, I could say something positive about Germans and possibly, if pushed, even the French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the most important thing, not the most important thing, but but the, the, this process of, of preserving yourself relies on some sense. Uh, ha- having this... Uh, this intergenerational category you can be a part of and, and and kind of describe the story, a story that's larger than yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, but Hey, let's go on to the super chats. Yeah, yeah, so I don't keep it. you here forever. Uh, Munchy Wolf for $3 USA. Carl's magic worked for the Taliban. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, well, that's totally true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the, my magic, you know, the Taliban, uh, you know, the Taliban, had an ancient management, you know, Islamic magic that they were calling upon, but it worked, yeah. didn't it? Took them 20 years, 25 years, but you know, Pe- people believed in them. They didn't believe in the global American empire. Exactly. That's for sure. Exactly. You know. this, this, the magic works. You just have to believe. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, what people call me. Magic is, I always hated that term. It is, it is just the power of, of spirit, the power of belief, belief, which is in some weird way. And this is what I mean when I say faith, when I say faith, I mean that the power of belief is greater Mm -hmm. than the phenomenon of belief in a person's brain. And I'm not, I think, I think you can be an atheist and believe that, but that is a phenomenon that I've witnessed in history Mm -hmm. and other historians have witnessed in history. And it seems to be true, even if you don't have a current theology for a greater spirituality. Yeah, I mean, um, the, 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 the term spirituality, I don't think should be viewed as a purely religious term, right? Like, the, it, you can believe in things in a spiritual way. Like, I mean, genuinely, like my, my belief in England, I find, is actually a spiritual sort of belief in it. Oh, and, yeah, it's a spiritual belief. Yeah, yeah. and I... I it took me a long time to be able to admit that basically, you know, yeah. uh, you know, coming out of the, the new atheist rationalist, uh, intellectual tradition, if you can dare call it that. Have you, have you um, ever read GK Chatterton's orthodoxy perchance? No. I highly recommend that book. Uh, I, I think, I think Catholic you think it might be, a po- it is apologetics, but it, <laughs> but it's, 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 it, 
he talks mm-hmm. about this thing where he says, and he actually uses England. He says, you know, you can only really love things if you love them in a spiritual way. If you yeah. love England because it's an empire, he said, he literally said this. He said, if you love England because it's an empire, then what all, the only thing you're going to do is you are going to make apologies for how well we rule the Hindus. But if mm-hmm. you love England for the spirit of England, you'll love your own people even when the Hindus have conquered us. Mm. And, you know, that's, I mean, maybe in the era of Rishi Sunak, that's <laughs> not not a bad thing to keep in mind, right? Yeah, I, uh, okay, okay. What's it called? <laughs> I'm not oh, trying to get you canceled, Carl. No, 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 no. He's, he's obviously got a point. What's it called on alert now? Oh, uh, it's orthodoxy. Um, it's, uh, if you've heard anything by G.K. Chetron, he's a delightful writer. <sighs> Right. Uh, yes, I've yeah. heard, and yeah. I've avoided G.K. Chesterton just because, for the same reason, I avoided C.S. Lewis, because uh, ah. people are like, "Man, you're starting to sound a lot like C.S. Lewis." I'm like, <laughs> "I've never read C.S. Lewis." I'm like, well, maybe you should think about it. And so I did read C.S. Lewis, and I was like, "Wow, he is making a lot of good points." <laughs> you have you have to read Orthodoxy less. I'm like ordering a, it now. Yeah, but you have to read it not as, but but you have to read it as a letter to um, uh, people like George Bernard Shaw. It, right. He writes it yeah. in a way that's like a blog post, right? It's not yeah. meant to be like a this proposition, then yeah. this proposition. It's supposed to be no, like no, a bunch of jokes, yeah. right? So it's a lighthearted book, but it yeah. has like deep, profound, such a dry title. It's such a dry title. It sounds like, yeah. but it, it, it's, 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 it's funny, right? It's like, you know, uh, yeah, but um, this, this is how I feel about Burke's uh, reflections on the revolution in France. Like, yeah. it's not funny, obviously, but you can tell that this was kind of a, an extended fit of passion for Burke. Like, there's yeah. not even chapters. You know, it's just this one long screed that goes on for like 300 pages. And you can oh, just yeah. imagine the furies. How could you not understand all of these things that the most basic of things that I'm going to write down? It's, 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 and it's brilliant. You know, and, it's, and you if, can... you th- if you think that's a crazy screed, read Thomas Carlyle's Re- French Revolution history. That, if you want to talk about. N- it's virtually unreadable, but uh, but the pathos in that writing is insane. Right, it was okay. the direct inspiration for Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Oh, Although I don't okay. think they agreed in terms of politics. Uh, that's just a seminal work. Um, hmm. But Okay, uh, I'll, and, and, I'll, yeah. I'll look that up as Sorry. well. I know the AA has been going on about Carlisle a lot. Well, Car- I really dislike Carlisle's pro style. Uh, right. I, I find G.K. Chesterton's pro style to be delish. People hate mm. that word delicious, but I, I find it is, it's very fun to read. And Joseph DeMaestro's yeah. pro style is also very fun to read. Mm. But Carlyle is very Victorian and he, he almost is more of Vict- a, he's like concentrated Victorian pro style more yeah, than I Victorian writers that. themselves. Yeah. Uh, so it's so heavy. It, it, so right. sometimes he puts people off because of that. Um, okay. So the next super chat is uh, the Enrib for $5. Dads are cool. Ask a child that grew up without a dad yeah. what they wanted and needed most in life. Man, I, I'm telling you, don't sit there and say, I'm a dad, therefore I'm not cool. My God, man. Like, I am I am the coolest person in my son's entire universe. Every day, I come home from work, and he's just like, Dad! And he's eight now. And he's done it <laughs> since he was two. You know? And he still does it. And, you know, he wants me to do things with him all day, every day. And, it, you know, obviously I can't all the time, but, like, I'm telling you, man, there's no, and, and that's a great point. There are so many kids these days growing up without dads. They wish, they wish they had someone like you around, man. They wish. It's it's just there, there's there's just a qualitative difference between what what we, we want and what what wins in the game of social media and attention. Yeah, but, man, and, I'll tell you, my dadism is going quite well though. Like, you know, oh they're, well they're, can, actually, Carl, I did I don't think I've spoken to you since the latest, right? I should say oh, yeah. congratulations. I, well, you know, I know much. I did on Twitter, but that doesn't really count, does it? Right? Yeah, no, it's it's fine. It's fine. You know, I'm, I'm, but thank you. She's doing very well. She's like two months old now or something. Uh, yeah, I let, my, I let my wife deal with dates. Uh, you know, time yeah. time for me is a kind of omnipresent now. Uh, <laughs> and and you know, whatever dadism means for sons, it means something entirely different for daughters and. Oh yeah, that, that, you know, that Jordan will Peterson. be. You, tell me how that goes. <laughs> well, J- Jordan Peterson, uh, when I posted it on Twitter, Jordan Peterson retweeted it saying, "You are going to be the most important person in this person's life, so just remember that." And I was like, "Yes, sir." You know, <laughs> um, 
but the but when, when I say dadism, it's kind of this meme uh, where basically I'll make uh, podcast segments or videos just explaining like a basic dad concept from the position yeah. of a dad who's just like, look, I'm not even I'm not accepting a Zuma counter argument to anything I'm saying. I am telling you, you need to do this and you will get a good result. And if you don't do this, it'll suck. Right. I've, I'm writing a script at the moment. Just don't have sex on the first date. You whores. <laughs> right. Both of you. Just don't do it, right? This is timeless daddist wisdom that your father should have told you, but of course you're a fatherless Zuma, right? Okay. This, this, sounds, this sounds like a great TikTok series, Sargon. You know, you can you can you can you can encapsulate your dadisms in little one minute clips that can there are, yeah, play on we repeat. Have, we have loads of them on TikTok. In, actually. In the heads. Oh, you you guys have been. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean specifically, they have to be like in a in, in a particular mode yeah. a, a particular idiom so to speak sure uh, but the, the, the when, whenever i do these segments in these videos i'm just approaching it from the perspective of this is the voice of experience and you're 19 right so shut up you're wrong i'm right and i'm not I, i'm not even going to argue it right and, and it's been surprisingly popular actually because i do think there are a lot of young people out there who want a sort of fatherly guidance because at the, bo the bottom of fatherly guidance is your self-interest you know i'm looking out for you i don't gain anything if you don't have sex before you get married or before you go on, you know, before you're on your third date or something, I don't give a fuck. You know, it's not for me that I'm telling you this. I'm telling this for you because you lose something, which is the kind of beginning of a bond of something sacred that, you know, you stitch together. If you just like, and what inspired this is a post of this girl is like, I met this guy. I liked him. So he had sex and he was like, can we have anal? And so we had anal. And I was like, do you want to see me again? Was that that like, horrible no, like, whatever show that, you know, you know that show with the 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 vapid zoomer women they show clips of it all the time i yeah i've seen the one you're talking about right and it, it wasn't on that it was a, a post on the internet and this woman was like why doesn't he want to see me again i gave him everything i wanted and i'm like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> like no man is going to date a woman who has anal on the first date i, mean, I <laughs> can't believe i had to tell you this but, uh, no, but yeah uh, but th this is important but this this is the thing, right, with the, the, the whole arguments thing. I mean, like, if, if a society has to argue itself into, you know, women shouldn't literally become prostitutes for very Not small amounts of money. If the society has to have a debate over this, that society is dying. Yes. <laughs> some things have to speak with the, they, they have to be, sp some words have to be spoken. It, you have to sing it more than you have to speak it. Yes. You know, I'm copying Joseph de Maistre when I say that all prayers must be sung and all yep. stories that people, all, all stories that fathers tell their daughters don't have to be argued. They have to be sung and felt viscerally in the moment and, and not mm. as part of some kind of, uh, you know, dialectic. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's go but on. But if no uh, one's saying it at all, I think it's more valuable to have it said than not said. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, you you, you write, the, I'm copying the master again, you write the word, you speak the words when you cannot sing them and you write them yeah. when you cannot speak them. But every time it becomes more dead, it becomes more an element of the past, a piece of information. Oh when AI this can like melancholy out. is driving me crazy. Uh, okay, like, okay. No, <laughs> you can take your uh, look, do, we your, be, we your begin Duke of Orange we begin at and, the first step, and the first step is explaining don't have anal on the first date, and then once that has been drilled into the first person, right then we can start building the symphony. Okay, you got to get the got to get the first note down ah uh, well i i think that the i i believe that essence precedes form and and the first i think well this is the eternal ah, i don't agree with that i don't know if there's a, a distinction between the two uh i think we're about to reopen the debate that schism the orthodox and catholic church so i'll move i'll move on uh, about whether yep. about whether uh you know which, which element of the trinity uh, essence uh, precedes the others but okay dreadnought for five dollars i'm a longtime fan of both of yours since gamergate for sargon sargon actually helped me turn away from new atheism over time and dave was an instigating guy behind my conversion to catholicism i owe you both a love uh, i owe you both a lot love epochs love epochs by the way uh, thank epochs. you it's, it's my favorite oh. series 
Oh, that's the, that's a, a Lotus. That's Eater the series? history series we did. Oh yes, yes. Um, I've seen clips of that. Hmm. Yeah, I have to. I, 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 there's so much good content out there. I can't. I can't um, oh, watch it all. Right. Don't worry. I, I don't have time to watch any of the content we produce. Like yeah. you know, like my in-laws really like the Lotus Eaters. <laughs> Oh really? Well, that's great. I'm I'm glad to hear that actually. My my, my in laws are are a bunch of Canadian normie cons, so <laughs> that's great. No, but that's they're the people we want to talk to. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like we, there's no point talking to you know highly technical red pilled people who are just doomering on the internet. You know that that that's a sm- very small constituency. That's people. my entire audience, Sargon. I know. <laughs> I, I I make content to be basically consumed by content creators. That's why I, I do these yeah, horribly esoteric right. essays. I um, know, and that's yeah. why I watch them. Yeah, <laughs> but I need to speak to the the Normicon, right? Yeah. And to be like, listen, guys, you know, there's there's magic in these lands, and we can summon it. The discovering the magic in a dissolution age is that that's the the mm. the, the key that we're missing yes. um the villain troll trollinsky sargon how can one def- defend the legitimacy of a people or a civilization that has failed all its communist revolutions <laughs> sorry can, how can you defend apparently just- i think he, he means england has failed to have a communist revolution or something like that it's, it's or, not to its credit yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I, I i view that as the starting point which civilizations didn't have a communist revolution well they're the ones that have got some truth underneath them well you know you know what i i kind of take by the way you should really try to interview curtis yarvin for yeah, the, it'll be i think you guys would really have a lot to bounce off each other but but i i, I know why america and england didn't have communist revolutions it's because we invented communism uh we w- england and america are the first communist countries and the first communist regime was called sir o- our oliver cromwell um yeah but, but you notice how we just brought back the king right? I, I i mean you got in the words of monty python you got better <laughs> yeah <laughs> right? yeah yeah no but but the, it didn't take an england man we, the right. ma- magic exists and it was so much stronger then than it is now but the, the magic prevents it the magic is the barrier well well yeah you developed a resistance to this bug right and and uh but well, we had it in us all the, the whole time uh right. yeah i mean well sure and i i don't know i think that this is sort of spengler's argument that uh, that that well, Spengler believed that uh, magic lives and dies, right? So he believes that even though you are genetically related to the Britons of Julius Caesar, that the magic that inhabits Anglo-Saxon Britain is just fundamentally different from that that yeah. ex- ex- inhabited Bodica and totally. and you know and, and and so, but but you know, and and I feel a little bit like you know I understand that the genetic and religious traditions will carry on but the the magic is going to kind of have to die and be reborn to exist again you know how i've been conceiving of it is uh the kind of um the ice core versus the river uh framing of history right um because this this is why people in the middle east do not give a flying fuck about the civilizations that came before the islamic civilization because yeah. uh, we in the West look at it like an ice core. We drill down, we bring up this long bit of ice that's got various different uh, layers to it. But these different layers are the products of multiple different rivers. And the river is the flowing of the magic. And they so their river comes from Mecca, right? Their river comes from Arabia. And so they don't care that the ice core has many different other rivers that have frozen beneath it. Um, and so digging that up, they're just like, okay, but that's not our river. You know, they're very much in their own river. Whereas that, that's, a, that's, so- a, that's a difference between Islam and Christianity is that Christianity developed this idea that it flowed from two, two sources, right? Uh, it's, it's da- not, Dante not, explicitly says this, right? It, it's not a literal river uh, or even very a metaphorical river. Well, what I mean is like in, in, <laughs> if in you use West, Jordan in the ti- and, and the Tiber, you might not be too far away from literal. I mean, I mean, the 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 magic of the civilization flows like a river, right? So it doesn't have to begin. It doesn't have to begin and end in one place in the world, right? Uh, whereas in 
the post enlightenment scientific west we look at a piece of land and pull up the ice core and assume that it's all connected in some way well mm. i don't i don't really feel any spiritual connection to stonehenge right there's nothing like stonehenge is an interesting artifact of a previous civilization that died and was replaced with anglo-saxon england yeah and River if you're welsh are definitely genetically related to those people if you're welsh yeah, absolutely you know but the, the river of anglo-saxon england is a different story that comes from somewhere else that actually doesn't include stonehenge to me right and so i don't yeah. i don't feel i mean obviously you know they're an anti they're an ancient artifact that's in wiltshire right so i don't or well, somerset so i don't want them destroyed or anything like that and you know they're a lovely tourist thing but i don't look at them in the same way that i look at the magna carta you know i went to salisbury mm. cathedral and saw an original copy of the magna carta and i was horrified that it wasn't even guarded but then it occurred to me that nobody realizes that this is sacred, <laughs> right? And so nobody realizes to think to attack it because why would anyone care? I'm one of the few people who realizes the 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 significance of this in the magical river of the civilization, um, you know. And so the ice core theory, like it's just a wrong way of looking at these civilizations, and it explains why the Islamic world is happy to destroy Babylonian artifacts. They don't care, you know. Yeah, but I I, I don't know about the the relationship i mean there is some there is some echo of the roman that you see in the italian sure there is some echo there right and there's some echo of the viking in the swede although often yeah, i'm, I'm having a little bit river. sick about modern modern northern europeans pretend, pretending to be vikings when they you know they're so separated from their immediate christian ancestors you know yeah but the, the, they're a part of the same river they're the same civilization that had a continuity um, even though they adopted Christianity, it didn't break the continuity of the Scandinavian civilizations. The fall of the Roman Empire didn't mean that the Italians weren't the descendants of the Romans, right? But the spread of Islam across Babylon, uh, Babylonia, did break the continuity of those people thinking of themselves as Babylonians, right? So they like it's they don't view themselves as connected to that civilization, and so they don't see it as sacred in the same way that i don't see stonehenge as sacred frankly yeah that this is interesting uh, this is such a rabbit hole that i, yeah, I kind of don't want to touch it because it's like i could yeah this is a really big rabbit hole i i it understand is, yeah. exactly what you're saying yeah because i i did the, this experiment where i said oh because i was having an argument with pagans and they were talking about ancestor worship and i was trying to think of a pagan german that would even be worthy of worship and like this can't think like i can see hildegard von bingen and go like okay you know i, I we're on the same page Hanks and Horsa. but like yeah it's like it's like basically like old rack or the the guy that um who is that guy uh the, the guy who like destroyed Varus's column right or something like that hmm. you know uh in in you know I, I, on the uh, uh what was it the the, the famous ghost. battle yeah uh, uh okay anyway let's let's keep on going here um uh so uh i hope i'm getting this in right okay um dads are cool so the end rub says dads are cool this ask dad who grew up with that dad we already answered that one uh dreadnought for five dollars usa um also carl becoming quite a spiritual person uh i grew up in the woods of northern california in almost a 1950s atmosphere the amount of cultural shift I've been through in the last 30 years has been embittering to coin a word. Why well, I, I definitely know how Cal Northern California has changed in the last mm. 50 years. That's not a little depressing. Um, I don't know if you have a comment on that, but we can keep on going. No, no. I just, I can imagine that probably even 30 or 40 years ago, California was a, I mean, I remember actually, I remember the, affection and reverence that people used to talk about california with there there was kind of a division though there there was definitely i think in europe if you think of california people think of southern california there was yeah. also kind of a northern california iteration too mm -hmm. much more about like living close to the land and mm -hmm. you know uh, there's this whole sort of bay culture along the west coast that's it's very old like there's all these victorian buildings that are built out there mm. that I mean, they're all kind of disrepaired and these are depressing communities these days. But uh, yeah, there's this whole kind of place that time for God in Northern California. Lady of Shalott for $5 USA. Speaking from personal experience, being a parent is the one thing that will give your life meaning. 
The same cannot be said for being an economic unit. There just aren't enough great careers to go around. This was the great mistake of the baby boomers is to is to kind of co-locate meaning inside a professional capacity. Yeah. When really even if you had a great career. So yeah, you know, there, there's problems with even if you even if you were like Steven Spielberg, there's problems with making your career your core of meaning. But yeah. the, the the more immediate problem for virtually everybody is that you aren't Steven Spielberg. You are working a job, hmm. and the 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 meaning has to come from another place that's real and. You know, and that's true and good and beautiful, and and you you can't find that, especially since corporate jobs have become so much more sterile. Mm. Someone like just in the last seven years, since COVID has made the corporate job that was already incredibly sterilized from mm. successive iterations of HR, it's made it even more sterile. It, you know, it feels like you're in a surgery ward. You know, I can't even. Nobody imagine. wants this. I can't. I can't even imagine what it must be like to live in and work in say san francisco right yeah it's, it's gotta be it's gotta be hell uh, well, i have i have a, a a bunch of family in san francisco but it's yeah i mean san francisco i'll just say this it's it's, it's embarrassing it's embarrassing because tourists always want to come and see it and because it has a reputation of being one of the most beautiful cities in america and they walk around it and you're just you're just kind of rubbing your head because the and it's gotten a little bit better. It, it, the low point of this was in 2020, but they got rid of one of the Soros. D, this is the, it, it waxes and wins. They got rid of one of the Soros district attorneys. And so it's gotten a little bit better, but, but really it's just, it's just embarrassing because the, anyone from the outside, you all know what they're thinking. You all know what they're thinking is how could you let this happen to one of the great cities of the world? How could you let oh, yeah. this happen? You know, and that's not even to get to the soul of Silicon Valley culture, which it's its own can of beans. Um, I, I went to San Francisco a few years ago, man, and the buildings are amazing, and the streets are like hell. Yeah, it's just genuine. Yeah. I, I don't genuinely know what to do with San Francisco because it's it's a it's a very poorly suited city for what it what it wants to be. It's not designed for high population density, mm -hmm. uh, but it's trying to pack every person into its technology sector it possibly can. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, which at this point makes zero sense, but another can of worms. Generico for Australian $50. Great chat. Is this a process you were describing, this restoration reformation? Is it mythically like Petersonian archetypes of the hero venturing into chaos to rescue the spirit <laughs> of our fathers? It seems like you're getting close to articulating exactly what you mean in practical terms. The man mm -hmm. who can do it will be the true king. Um, yeah, well, it's all of those things. It's, it's Yeah, it is. You know, it's a full spectrum issue. Uh, I I see this as the process of encountering death, and th this is how I put it. This is how I square the Spenglerian cycle of civilizations: is that at different periods you encounter chaos and death, hmm. and part of who you were decides that it wants to destroy itself and kill itself. And the part of yourself that loves life enough to keep on going doesn't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that that the part of yourself that kills yourself is your entire mimetic identity. And only your biological dimension carries forward. And that's what happened potentially at the fall of the Roman Empire. The reason why you cannot feel for Stonehenge what you feel for Canterbury. Mm. But mm. Uh, that is the cycle. And I, I don't think... I think that mm. Italians and Greeks, when the um, when the fall of the Roman Empire happened, I think not all of their mimetic memory decided to elect for its own destruction, and, and so they still feel a certain thing. Mm. But uh, you know, this is the process that we described in in completion. Yeah, I think that's perfectly put. Uh, Euro Diva for five dollars USA. What do you think is the ultimate fate of breakaway groups like SSPX and others striving to preserve more traditional religious cultural epochs while still claiming fidelity to institutions opposed to these older traditions? This seems like more of a question. Well, actually, that's kind of your relationship to the King of England. It's my relationship <laughs> to the church in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, Catholics totally got cucked by COVID. 
uh, because Protestants all just skirted around the restrictions and the the Catholic authority structure was used to completely uh, crater communities that had been strong before. They're coming yeah. back now. It's, it's not a reason to leave Catholicism, um, but this is this is a major problem for Catholics, uh, where our authority structure is just raining down bad, bad and confusing instructions. Uh, to it, it's basically like the the king becoming woke. Although yeah. even, a little bit more serious, although the Catholic Church hasn't gone quite that far. Yeah, but I've um, I've been needling you about this for years. Yeah, the Pope not being a Catholic. Well, I mean, I mean the the Pope is deliver. I mean the Pope has essentially taken the Church as far left as it possibly can go without breaking, and in some ways is breaking it. Charles um, will do the same thing with the monarchy. Yeah, and I mean, what what do you do? I mean, how do you? these these latin congregations that are essentially being kicked out of their mm -hmm. churches i mean like they, they're like five times as big as like these boomer parishes that you know that, that have only geriatrics in them and mm -hmm. they get kicked out of the cathedral and have to celebrate this traditional mass in a mobile home <laughs> Madness. yeah and it just it, it just and 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 this is the contradiction that we're going to have to survive through uh and, and I, don't, I don't know what to do about it because obviously if, if the king violates his coronation oath, he's no longer king. And if the Pope violates the doctrine of the church, then they've, they have not so much obliterated Christ, but they have obliterated their authority to speak as Pope. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, look guys for, for my thing, the, the, there is the core, the core of the church is the sacraments. So make sure that you have a relationship with the sacraments that is being given to you by somebody who you believe has apostolic succession and i believe that is sufficient I, I basically you know be be loyal to to the spirit to to the eternal church and uh you know i mm -hmm. guess that's what you do for all of these things right i th i think that um you've got to keep the faith in times of darkness keep up the rituals, keep up the tradition, do the thing, even if it's unpopular. And even if you are cast into the darkness to do it, you still have to do it. it a spiritual monarchy is a little bit harder though, right? Uh, well, people in the chat being like, God, it's actually a one, one to one comparison with Charles and the Pope now. Cause he's the head <laughs> of the church of England. And you know, Oh uh, yeah, I guess that's true. Right. But yeah, yeah, it, it totally is. It totally is. And this is why the Tory boys are on fucking suicide watch on Twitter. We pointed out that Charles is woke and we're going to have a woke king. They were like, no, 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 he's not. He's not. He, he obviously is. What is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> like I literally had some of them being like, well, it's just the language that everyone uses now and it's okay for him to use it. It's like, oh, brilliant. We've normalized the next phase of the revolution. Yeah. So now even the, and another one was like, oh, well, you know, you can't, Okay, yeah, he's be and I literally said he was being subverted. And like, yeah, okay, he's being subverted, but you're not really saying the king's a communist, are you? It's like, well, I mean, if he's being subverted, like, you know, how far down do we have to go until we say, yeah, okay, he's a communist? Like, it's oh god, I'm not looking forward to. It. Yeah, it's 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 just a, it's just a mess. I see the Catholic Church is trending on Twitter, and I I just don't want to click on it. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I feel you, man. I feel you. Yeah. Uh, Bjork for five dollars USA. The only dissident idea I have found to be effectively transmittable to my politically non-aligned friends, we are all Danish AI engineering students, uh, is the descriptive idea of mole bug elite theory. Do you think mm. these ideas, these ideas generally have this quality? Do you think these ideas generally have this quality? Well, my elite theory is political realism. That's yeah. Machiavelli and its subsequent derivations. The esoteric stuff is much harder to track. Not all of it's religious. Obviously, like there's Spengler, and uh, I do call a Vola religious. I don't, but I mean, Peterson channels this stuff too to a certain extent, right? The, the sort of in intuitive description of of, of spirit. Um, I don't know. Engineers are kind of autistic. Designed, not yeah. Th this is. I'm telling you, man, the struggle against AI is a struggle against cognitive security and autism. Mm. It's the struggle against uh, realizing that there is greater there is greater relevance than simple 
simply being able to fake something and replicate it. Um, there was always those ancient tribes that that felt like you were stealing their soul when you took their picture. Yeah, uh, but but I guarantee you, people are going to sell their souls to something that can replicate their 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 external features via AI. Yeah, um, Chat GPT, I think, is just a curse, man. Oh, I see people curse. becoming dependent on it already. It's like, don't I mean, like, if you're a writer, like, don't you want it to at least be your authentic thoughts, right? Yeah, but even if they're not as good as Chat GPT, at least it's real. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean they're they're not your authentic thoughts. What they are is the thoughts of the internet, and yeah. they're not even Chat GPT's authentic thoughts. What they, what yeah. they are is every single person's digitized thoughts, uh, massaged into a random number generator and spit out grammatically at the end, mm. with the prompt as a guide to for what it should say. Right. Yeah, and, and this is the thing. This is why poetry has made sense to me more and more is, is that so much is so much small is located in in small word choices uh pardon me there's uh my son's crying in the background it's okay, I can hear. <laughs> i'm very used to the sound You're very used to that i, I yeah. don't think it actually registers as much on the stream yeah. probably the listeners aren't even no I, I could hear it. I could hear it yeah um uh, but but yeah, like the, the there there is sort of a reality of of small word choices and things like that. Mm. Um, my, uh, my favorite author to use as an example for that is Plutarch. Oh, Plutarch, Parallel Lives. I remember yeah. reading that like twenty years ago. <laughs> Re reread it and just think of the economy and efficiency and richness of some of the words. Like when, the example I always go to is how he describes Sulla's return to Rome and how Sulla debauched the army that was sent to stop him and brought it across to his side. So he didn't even have to fight it. And it's like, there's so much in the word debauched. Like it's, you know, he did something to the other army and it was sordid, you know, it was, and, and yet, you know, he got what he wanted out of it. Um, the, and, and it's just all, it's all contained in that one word, but you can feel the judgment in it. And it tells you everything you need to know about the way Sulla did it. Man, I mean, this is why this is why classical education uh, mm. always was reading uh, yeah. these things in their original language. Because I imagine that what you're describing here, and what we both, I assume, read in translation, yes. would be only coming out more in its original. Was it Latin he wrote in, or was it Greek? I know he was Roman, but um, I well, he was a Greek in Rome, uh, so oh, I he was a Greek he in wrote... Rome. Okay. I assume he wrote in Latin. I would have to check that. Because Aurelius wrote in Greek, and that was hundreds of years later, right? I mean, it might have been in Greek. I I, I read the English translation, so I have, I have no idea. All right, interesting. Well, I'm going to keep on going here. Um, uh, yeah, so R R Rigomatic, I mean, to answer Bjork's question, a lot of this stuff is just going to be, what we're doing is we're sort of formalizing our intuitions, and that's just not going to translate like a lead theory will which is no. elite theory is just let's observe the human animal as he is, no. uh, you know, and it comes from Machiavelli. So, so some of this is not going to be accessible to people who are very, very myopic in their intellectual approach. Uh, Rigomatic for $5 USA. Dave, Carl, great chat. Carl, your story about meeting up with a group of people from different places reminded me of similar times moving from Australia to Canada, keen for some good basket weaving in the future. Oh yes. Uh, definitely. I will always promote our basket weaving project. It's definitely a thing in England. And I'm mm -hmm. working on an icon for basket weaving based on the Lady of Shalott, who, in my opinion, was the original weaver, uh, the, the original femme cell shut-in that, that comes out of her cage, <laughs> tragically. But I'm um, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Uh, any reactions to meeting up with people? No, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> like, get out off the internet, talk to people in real life perfect yeah and it's worked mark, pretty mark well. uh, horton does it over in england contact him on twitter yeah it, it's worked pretty well i mean this is morgoth wrote a great article about uh authenticity you know he created mm. uh about how like you know he he did this basically you can only appreciate value and scarcity and effort you know mm. the 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 warhammer miniatures you paint like they feel special right yeah and, and, and they feel special because you put effort into them. And he said, like, look, look, I generated this image in AI, 45 seconds. I don't okay. care about it. But if I had yeah. painted it myself, I would have felt yeah. very, very proud. 
and the beauty standard is much much lower right? yeah exactly right yeah. and 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 so like it, it's only in scarcity that we can obtain value uh, but there is also a quality that cannot be contained in mm -hmm. in the things that are mass produced which is necessarily everything at the stage yeah. That, um, that's a great point about the Warhammer miniatures, though. Like people, and or, you know, they we genuinely love the Warhammer miniatures, not because the miniatures themselves are in any way unique. Until we have spent, we've literally mixed our labor with them. Well, that, know, that's what makes the game fun too, right? The, the, yeah. The, the moment every game has a moment of victory for chess, mm. it's like analyzing, like the, it's the deep thought moment where you see the move, right? Yeah. With poker, the moment's the bluff right? The bluff makes poker, right? The moment that makes Warhammer is, um, it, it, this is why the painting of them is essential. The moment that makes Warhammer is when you, you go over to your friend's army and you like blow away all of his figurines and he has to remove them from the table. And you, and he, he, you know that you've inflicted harm upon him because each one of those guys he removes yeah. from the table took him yeah. like an hour to paint. <laughs> and, now, only... and now you just crush them. <laughs> <laughs> right. if it were only one hour man my my yeah. thousand sons right each one uh each <laughs> literally they're the most intricate fucking marines you'll ever find must have taken about three or four hours per model right and then when pete is nuking them off the fucking table it is genuinely a heartbreaking moment to take my beautifully painted guys that i spent untold hours on and just dump them back in the box because that's, that's the moment of warhammer that that's the yeah. moment that is the yeah. moment of warhammer because it is it's, it's the one way in which the tabletop actually recreates the tragedy of loss and war yes <laughs> <laughs> and and it's also why unpainted you miniatures are like, heresy. No, no, you're my buddy. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, no, exactly. You've got an emotional attachment to this goddamn thing. You spent literally five hours painting. Yeah, exactly. but, it, but it's also why the unpainted miniatures are heresy, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Like, right. You've put no fucking it. Get some paint on those fucking things. So well, I know you're invested when I destroy them. You assemble them, right? <laughs> yeah, well, brilliant. You know, that took five minutes. <laughs> The assembly and, and I say this, I haven't played the game like once in my entire life. Oh, it's but, so good, man! It's so good. Um, I, but I, but, but I, I, I actually like uh, uh, what fascinates me about board games is I feel that every board, so every computer programming language, hmm. involves a different way of thinking about a math problem. Every single board game involves uh, a certain moment of decision or emotion that it's designed to generate. Yeah. And, 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 and that's in every board game, I always look for that thing where I, I try to locate the central moment of the game. Mm. I'm not so sure what that moment is in magic, the gathering, but I've been, I've been kind of trying to formulate it in my mind too. In, in magic, the gathering, it's when you can see in your, when you have it in your hand, like mm -hmm. a particular card, the opponent isn't expecting. And if you make a certain play and the play goes through, you win the game. That's yeah, and it's also, but there's also a component of of meta too in that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it definitely they might have the counter in their hand. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into board game nerds. I was I, I, saying, I, I like I, I, I like this game. Counter. I got back into Magic the Gathering by playing this game called Netrunner, which is made by the same guy Richard Garfield. It was. Mm -hmm. It's like an improved magic, and it does that moment better than magic does. It's actually really? you know, it's by the same creator. Yeah. Uh, but Magic the Gathering has an additional component to it, in addition to that moment you're talking about. But hmm. get, we're we're getting really nerdy here, so let's let's get. No, back. that's fine. I, I think you are right though. I think it's the the moment they you realize they don't have the counter, which is that moment. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also a feeling that, like you know, uh, the, there's also a feeling of ownership in in mm -hmm. the deck itself that's similar to Warhammer too. Yeah, because um, you crafted it, and I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, which is which is not present in other card games like Netrunner. Mm -hmm. Netrunner, uh, they're interchangeable. It's it's all about the the, the bluffing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's such such we're so nerded out there. Uh, I love Melon for five dollars. Uh, um, uh speaking of prostitutes i heard prostitution was legalized in germany and now shows up on job listings that are sent out to the unemployed if women I've refuse no to doubt. take these jobs they can get their unemployment cut <laughs> i've got no doubt that that's the case i mean we legalized prostitution with only fans and we made it we made it a prestige profession we're so gone guys i just it's just i can't i can't it 
the whole point of 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 existence is to is to imagine that you could see your ancestors and with enough explanation of your circumstances you know have them kind of appreciate the man you are in your time mm -hmm. uh but how how could you ever explain how how well a, a wealthy society prostituted an entire generation of its women mm -hmm. and, and applauded themselves for doing that i i don't know i, I have no perverse yeah it's perverse it, it it's so strange um mm -hmm. Uh, Trey for G, uh, Great Britain Pound. Okay, that's GB. That's Great Britain Pounds, I assume. Yeah. Although I thought the name didn't Tony Blair. Okay, hold on, Sargon. This is an exogenous question. Did Did Tony Blair actually change the name of uh, of Great Britain to just Britain? No. Uh, so, so because I know he was like talking about doing that back in the day. Was he? Great Britain? No, Great Great Britain is the name of the large island. Uh, the United Kingdom is the name of the political entity that sits on the island. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. So, so Great Britain is just it, it's, it's just a geographical the designation. It's geographic. yeah. Oh, okay. So it's like Greater Britain, including Scotland, yeah. presumably. Okay, and then the United yeah, includes Kingdom. Scotland, Wales, and just the entire contiguous landmass of the large island of the British Isles. Okay, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Australian here and proud of my country's ties to the British Empire. Australia and the UK should be made closer again. Our mm -hmm. countries are so culturally linked. Long live the king. Okay, I'm going to add to this one before you answer it. Uh, okay, just say that with more majesty. Long live the king. Um, I am in contact with an enormous number of dispossessed uh, old stock Canadians that don't recognize Justin Trudeau's country as part of theirs. Uh, there's a di diaspora of not English people, but sort of loyalists to a crown that no longer holds itself hmm. as something to kneel before. And I don't know what to do with these people because, uh, I mean, as far gone as America is, Canada is further gone. Uh, hmm. What do you do with this? Uh, these people? That's not coming back. I, I don't think it's coming back. I don't know, man, but uh, long live the next king, maybe. I, I think that there's going to be a diaspora identity of uh, there's going to be a British there's going to be a British diaspora identity. There's going to mm. be a group of people in all countries that that share a certain kind of of, of ethnic camaraderie mm. and, and loyalty to a high political king that may not currently sit on any throne. Yeah, I, I recognize this in a lot of places. You see this everywhere in 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 conservative groups inside Canada. Mm. Uh, and I assume that's a similar emotion that's going on in, in, in Australia. Um, You'd have to ask them. I, I wouldn't know. I, I would like to know, though. I would like to hear from Australians on that and Canadians. Yeah, there's this whole Anzac culture in Australia. But it, the boomer generation really hauled it out. It became all about, like, drinking beer and talking about mm. Gallipoli or whatever, you know. Oh. Mm. Which, don't get me wrong, are fun things to do, but... yeah. Although it inspires, I, I assume that uh, Australian uh, nationalism inspires rather uh, the boomer Australian nationalism inspires uh, rather oppositional opinions about Winston Churchill than 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 boomer British nationalism. Sure, um, given the whole Gallipoli thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, there's a there's a video on YouTube called Stray a Day, S T R A Y A Day. Uh, which is meant to be an ironic pastiche of uh, Australian patriotism. But I watched it and I was like, well, I agree with all of that. <laughs> so, so you know. An Anzac Day was three days ago, what was apparently. It? Okay. okay that, makes, that makes sense, right? It was a spring. It's it's the Battle of Gallipoli it commemorates, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's, I thought it was in the summer. Uh, mm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess it's Turkey. It would be this would be the time to start an offensive if you were invading Turkey, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, surreal, surreal, surreality doctrine. This magic you speak of is divinity. Yes, we simply have forgotten how to invoke it. Our reality is an illusion. Our reality is an illusion is lifted after death. Billions watching the royal funeral lifted the veil for a small moment. Yeah. It's it's what they call 
an apocalypse, a lifting of the veil, right? Yeah. Um, death means summons divinity. Even magic. Death summons divinity, right? Yeah. Uh, I I don't know how else it can be summoned. I mean, in some sense, life does, but they used not, they used to be the all sorts way. of rituals to do this. And we no. Just, yeah. No divinity can ever be. This is how you know that. I mean, I'm. This is the Catholic great victories me, right? summon divinity. Great vic. Well, yes, battles summon divinity. You know, it doesn't have to be just a battle, but the the moment of victory, you can feel the magic, the imminent transcendence yeah. of it. But that's that's brought forward by sacrifice and supplication. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't trust any magic that can be summoned by will or mm. that can be bargained with yeah. that's just a general maybe this is the catholic in me but don't some don't trust mm. any spirit that can be bargained with as a general rule i agree this is well it has for, to be authentic and a product of your actions you know it can't just be persuaded this is where i i i'll part uh, ways with Lorgar from Warhammer. Uh, mm. The difference between an angel and a demon is not a matter of opinion. They behave very differently. <laughs> very differently. I'm I'm more than willing to give the Catholics the ground on this one. Okay, cool. Um, okay, the last one of tonight. Uh, Thomas Iskandar for $3 USA. Carl's, Carl, please tell Bu, uh, Bo. Um, what? Bo. Bo. Bo, in part. Please tell Carl, please tell Bo that his We Are Dreamers of Dreams speech from How Do We Save Britain brought me to tears. I also love the epochs. Oh, I have to... Oh, man, I hope he doesn't... I, I have a speech that's moving along these lines that I'm trying to write up. I hope he's not... But I think everyone's thinking along the same directions. That sounds like a really good speech. Yeah, it's really good. Um, basically, um, I like I said at my um, Skilding speech last year... Um, we we need to tell the stories that that animate our hearts, and this is what Bo did because I you know he 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 took this to heart and he was like yeah no I will do that, and this is what this person is saying has moved them, you know, um, and so you can see that it does have an effect, and we need to the the critical race theorists just did exactly this. this is, I'm just taking their strategy, and they were like look we'll just flood the airwaves with our stories, and we'll show people that there's an emotive uh, substratum to what we're doing, and we'll persuade them through uh pathos uh yeah pathos and they're right that's the way to do it and that's the magic let's let's make it happen mm, yeah so um that's the end of the uh entropy chats uh carl it's been great having you on this it's always so much fun to just chat about things you know uh, it's always a pleasure man. yeah it's it's great um let's not leave it eight months next time what Let's not leave it for another eight months. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I, I always feel, though, that um, I need to have something to talk to you about. <laughs> like, uh, really? I, I'm like, I, yeah, I'm like, I, I have no idea. What, because, um, you know, the first few times we talked, I, I was like, okay, I have got this message that Sargon needs to understand. First hmm. two times, for sure. Whereas this time, it's just, you know, I think we're kind of emotionally on the same page. And... Yeah. Really, what differs from us really is the more individualized experience that that we bring to the table. That probably is more regional and ethnic and religious than it is uh, some kind of like political analysis that I think you're missing or something like that. Mm. But um, yeah, it was great, man. Uh, yeah, no, I've lost. I mean, I, like I I can see you're like oh you're you're too optimistic, <laughs> but from my point of view, I'm starting thinking, God, it's not over. Come on. Pick yourself up. Uh, it's not over down. everywhere. It's just, um, you know, a lot of us are going to have to. Uh, it's going to suck. We're, we're going to have to uh, meet death a little bit more directly and say no to him a little bit more firmly than yeah. other people who might be able to fall back on on some. You know, every lesson humans have is either learned from tradition uh, or experience virtually nothing or and, and, and in this case the experience would be a negative one right pain mm -hmm. uh th there is literally i believe currently that virtually nothing is learned through theory yeah uh which is one of the reasons 
I don't know if this is unovercomable, but this is one of the reasons why AI will never achieve genuine intelligence, at least in its current form. Right. Uh, but let's not test that if I possibly yeah, can, you know, um, you know, but, but, uh, you know, th there's, uh, there's a certain dimension to this that, that, that has to be experienced and lived and, and, you know, so sometimes death has to be, be met in a way that's, uh, you have to meet it to, to really learn the meaning of, of why you need to say no to it. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we can end there. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good day. I'll talk to you, you guys too, later. And yeah, um, I'll catch you probably on the next podcast. I hope to talk to you later, Carl. Definitely.